Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, welcome. Welcome to the 2021 Millsaps Honors Conference. The Millsaps Honors Program offers students the opportunity to pursue original coursework under the mentorship of a faculty advisor. It integrates past coursework with rigorous independent inquiry, which leads to more advanced scholarship. The form of the honors thesis varies broadly. It may be a theoretical analysis, empirical study, musical composition, a body of artwork, business plan, or another form which allows the student to assert and defend an original idea. The thesis project is similar to a master's project, but at a level appropriate for the Millsaps undergraduate student. The thesis is written under the supervision of a faculty advisor, a second reader, and a member of the honors committee. Today, you will hear from 10 students as they present their honors research. The Millsaps Honors Program affords excellent preparation for each student's future endeavors. Of equal or greater importance, however, is the personal satisfaction and academic maturity derived from the intellectually challenging journey. We will take questions in the chat as well as in person following each presentation. Opening the conference is Emma Cavanero, who will be presenting her research in tort reform. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Cavanero and I did my honors thesis titled The Impact of Tort Reform, which is a study of policy in Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee. My thesis was done under the guidance of the Department of Government and Politics, with Dr. Nathan Schrader being my primary reader. I'd like to start with a quote by my favorite author, Atul Gawande, in his novel, The Checklist Manifesto. He wrote, one essential characteristic of modern life is that we all depend on systems, on assemblages of people or technologies or both, and among our most profound difficulties is making them work. Hopefully, you'll see this, how applicable this quote is to my entire project, and it's a quote that I kept close to my heart throughout my studies. My presentation outline is as follows. First, I'll introduce you to tort reform, go over my hypothesis and research question, discuss why I chose to study Mississippi, go through my methods and participants, my finding, and my conclusion. So, what is tort reform? Tort reform is an area of law that was first introduced in the 1970s by insurance companies and large corporations. It is designed to reduce the ability of a person to bring about tort litigation and reduce the damages that a person can receive. Tort reform became popular because of its focus on reducing damages, particularly in medical malpractice cases. In the United States, there has been a significant increase in medical malpractice lawsuits since the 1970s. The medical malpractice crisis resulted in doctors losing their jobs, insurance companies leaving high-risk areas, and a shortage of specialty doctors in these high-risk areas. My research question is simply stated, what is the impact of tort reform? Given that this project was done in the middle of uncertain times, my committee and I decided to leave my question as broad as possible and let the research take us where it led. My hypothesis is, it is predicted that tort reform will result in a decrease in defensive medicine, an increase in the number of medical malpractice trials, and a consensus that victims of medical malpractice are undercompensated in the relevant states. So, why Mississippi? When I was elected to, be in a, the, or elected to be in the honors program, I knew I wanted to study an issue that was relevant to the state I've called home for the past four years. Conveniently, when I chose tort reform and medical malpractice, Mississippi was the state to do that in. Mississippi became known as the medical malpractice capital beginning in the 1990s. The Tort Reform Foundation labeled the 22nd Judicial District, which is Jefferson Davis County, a, quote, judicial hellhole with jackpot justice. The issue in Mississippi began because the legislator states that a plaintiff can file anywhere that the defendant could be found. Now, this might be confusing, but technically, any of us could be found anywhere. So plaintiffs would take their cases to, pl to places with a history of returning large rewards, such as Jefferson Davis County. Between 1995 and 2000, there were 21,000 plaintiffs in Jefferson Davis County, despite a mere 10,000 residents. During this time period as well, the average reward doubled. Between 1995 and 2000, there were 21 verdicts over $9 million, seven of which were over $100 million. Prior to 1995, there were no verdicts over $9 million, so you can see how much the verdicts grew in this time. Because of the hostile lawsuit environment, doctors were leaving the states, insurance companies were leaving high-risk areas, 
and the insurance companies that stayed charged astro astronomical premiums. Mississippi knew they had a problem and their approach to fix it came in the 2004 House Bill 13. It consisted of three prongs. The first prong was to limit punitive damages. These are damages done to punish the defendant. Mississippi adopted a sliding scale based on defendant net worth. The high end of the scale was a $20 million limit on damages for a defendant net worth over $1 billion, with the low end being a 2% limit of a defendant net worth of $50 million or less. The next step was to constrain outlier pain and suffering. These are intangible factors that are the foundation of the largest awards. The third step was to limit duplicative hedonic damages, which are damages for loss of enjoyment of life. These are things such as going on a first date, debating politics, and recreational activities. However, these damages are separate from pain and suffering damages. So prior to tort reform, Mississippi was asking juries to reach two subjective non-economic damages. Under the tort reform, there was no loss of enjoyment of life separate from pain and suffering, and there was a $500,000 cap on non-economic damages. Tennessee and Arkansas were included in the study because of their proximity to Mississippi, and also because of the similarities in their tort reforms. In 2011, Tennessee passed the Civil Justice Act. This capped damages at $750,000, extending those damages to $1 million for catastrophic injuries. In 2003, Arkansas passed the Civil Justice Reform Act. This focused more so on limiting liability. Arkansas also created the phenomenon that became known as the empty chair. This meant that liability in Arkansas could only be found on those in the room. This meant that blame could be placed on someone who was outside of the room, which meant that they could not be found guilty, so plaintiffs a lot of the time were left without an answer. Arkansas is also currently debating issue one, which would limit lawyer fees and cap damages. Issue one has made it on the ballot twice and has failed both times, but goes to show that tort reform is still highly contested today. My methods were a 24 hour notice of questions to encourage conversations with my participants. I was speaking with a lot of pe people who were public figures in their communities. So I wanted to make sure that they were prepared to answer the questions but they weren't so prepared that they had time to write out a long scripted answer that they feel would be politically correct. All of my participants signed consent forms and my interviews were recorded to ensure accuracy since I was speaking with some public figures. The questions that I asked were broken down into two sets. Question set one on the left was given to those in the medical field and question set two was given to those in the legal and political field. Now you may be wondering why we combined questions for those in the legal and political field, but all of the politicians that I spoke to had law degrees, so we felt that they were thoroughly qualified to answer these questions. So we provided them with a little information. My participants were as follows. In the medical field, I had Dr. Thais Tenori and Dr. Amy Herbstreth of Tennessee and Mississippi. In the legal field, I had Ronald Sampson and Todd Griffin. And in the political field, I had former mayor of Shelby County, Tennessee, Bill Morris, and David Barria of Mississippi. So instead of going through everything that I talked about with all my participants, I decided to sum up each field with a quote that stood out to me the most. In the medical field, Dr. Herbster said, even when there is a cap, we still practice defensively because we're worried about moving forward. And just so you know, defensive medicine is qualified as the order of tests, treatments, and referrals to limit liability rather than to protect the patient. In the legal field, Ronald Sampson said, I certainly think that those who received substandard medical care have a greater likelihood of being undercompensated for catastrophic injuries because of the hard cap. And in the political field, David Barrios said, judges have become much more prone to render dispositive rulings before they ever get to juries because they don't want to be seen as a liberal judge. My conclusions were as followed. Increased job security was the main thing that came out of my conversations with both doctors. They no longer had to fear their entire livelihood being lost if they were sued. Prior to tort reform, both of my doctors knew people who lost their entire practices because of a medical malpractice lawsuit that they faced. Not only that, but specialty doctors are moving back into Mississippi because there is a little bit more job security here. Dr. Tenori had been a primary care physician in Mississippi for over 20 years, so she was an invaluable resource about what Mississippi looked like prior to the passage of tort reform. Prior to tort reform, she felt that she was no longer able to give her patients the referrals that they needed because specialty doctors were leaving the hostile environment. 
particularly in the fields of gynecology and neurology. Defensive medicine was something that was contested between both of my doctors. However, they agreed that defensive medicine is still the easiest route to take when treating a patient. They continue to work under strict regulations to protect themselves from lawsuits. One example of my doctors continuing to practice medicine defensively was with Dr. Amy Herbstreth in a situation she found herself with a patient. She placed a piece of hardware in the patient's foot, and when he walked on the surgical site too soon, he cracked the hardware in half. Because it was a weekend, she sent him to the emergency room, where an x-ray technician read the broken hardware as an in-bone infection. While this infection was later disproved to just be broken hardware, it was still on the patient's file, so she had to treat him as if he had this infection in order to protect herself from liability. This goes to show what doctors still go through today, even after the passage of tort reform. In the legal community, the increased difficulty to file and the higher chance of undercompensation were the two main conclusions. In Mississippi and Arkansas, an expert witness is needed in order to file a case. This is a huge problem because it's essentially asking doctors to sign an agreement that the other doctor did something wrong. And doctors are not willing to do this because of fear of being outcast from their professional community. Not only that, but you now have to file where the defendant is found. In the words of Todd Griffin, who is a huge Arkansas football fan, he said he feels that this loses the home field advantage. Because of this, and the overall difficulty in filing a case, he feels that there's an increase in settlement because people are trying to avoid going to trial. Not only that, but there's a significantly higher chance of undercompensation. They both spoke about how doctors feel they know their worst case scenario. That means that in Tennessee, a doctor knows that their worst case scenario is a damage of $750,000 unless the juries rule that it was catastrophic, in which their worst case scenario is $1 million. Not only that, but the significant slowing of the process increases the chances of reaching a statute of limitations. Todd Griffin represented a plaintiff who had the wrong part of his spine removed in a surgical procedure. This was immediately known because the surgeon took a post-operative x-ray where it was clear that he had taken out the wrong part of his spine. When the patient woke up from surgery and continued to complain about the same issues that he had before surgery, he was sent to physical therapy for something like 18 months to try and get the issue to go away. Obviously, the patient didn't get any better because the part of his spine that had an issue was still there and he was missing a different part of his spine. When he did not improve, the physical therapist took an x-ray of his own where the issue was revealed. This goes to show how the change in medicine can increase the chance in reaching that statute of limitations, which in Arkansas is in two years. Skipper Sampson also told me of an example in which a patient suffered severe injuries from a boating accident. I won't go into the details of this because it was honestly very gruesome, but he feels that this case, if any case in Mississippi, will be what appeals the cap to the Supreme Court. At the time of our discussion in October, the family was going through the necessary proceedings to try and appeal the case and the cap to the Supreme Court. In the political field, the unnecessary difficulty and unfair rulings were the two main conclusions. In the words of former Mayor Shelby County Bill Morris, the law is supposed to protect us, but the continuous changes defeat that goal and override the intent. Not only that, but the unfair rulings make it less cost effective to go to trial, which discourages people from seeking justice. David Barrow speaks about how tort reform changed the practice of law in Mississippi forever. These conclusions go to show that while decade-long predictions cannot be made when bills as these are passed, all potential outcomes should be considered in order to protect those involved. Thank you. Yes, you can go ahead. I have a question about um, some of your methodology. Yes. You said that you chose to only give them a 24 hour notice. I wonder yeah. if that is normal when doing research in this field, or if that's just something you can find out personally. So I decided on it personally. I honestly can't speak for what other researchers do, but this is something my committee and I discussed pretty in depth. Because these people are well known and some of them are running for different positions in the city, we wanted to make sure that they were comfortable answering the question but didn't have time to write it up with their you know, committees themselves and answer what the, in a way that they would feel would be correct and get them the best outcome. We wanted to encourage a natural conversation while still making sure that they were comfortable. 
Thank you. Any other All questions? Right. Um, honestly, I don't know. I feel like they all surprise me in different ways. I think it would be interesting in the future to look at whether or not the specialty, like the level of specialty within the medicine has anything to do with whether or not they still practice defensively. So Dr. Tenori is a primary care physician and she was the one who spoke about not practicing defensively while Dr. Herbstreth is a specialty doctor being a, a, a surgeon who works on podiatry. So. I think it would be interesting in the future to look into that because I do feel like there could be a correlation. Um, so that kind of going back and forth with that was interesting and was kind of my favorite part of looking into it because the medical reasons were kind of why I went into this project originally. So. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, well thank yeah. you. Let's thank our speaker one thank more time. Our next speaker is Eleni Funaraki. Her thesis is focused on the examination of biological systems in order to explain our role in this world and our interactions with our environment. It is a theoretical analysis of the theories of four philosophers and their ideas on substance and how it critically relates to our existence. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Eleni Fanuraki and I would like to present to you today my project on philosophy, which I completed under the supervision and guidance of Dr. Steve Smith, titled A Thought That Came Full Circle, Being a Part, Being a Whole, The Structure We Need in Our World. I would like to start with saying that science is not just a conglomeration of facts. Science is a systematic process with which we generate and build knowledge. Science is based on observations, reasoning and logic, which is how philosophy started. As we go back in ancient times, we're intrigued to see that philosophy and science were not yet distinct. The fact that we accept, for example, the heliocentric theory, the atomic theory and the plate tectonic theory shows that science also must envision facts in a way that makes sense to us, giving us a position in relation to the phenomena. Today, in the still existing horrifying debates regarding race, vaccination and animal testing, science both provides for an explanation based on evidence and serves as an ethical question in how we position ourselves in those systems. The social and political communication we ought to exhibit in both our everyday and professional lives is what we call ethics, the moral principle that governs who we are and what we choose to do. So, halls versus parts, substances versus processes are major issues of envisioning and ethics because they construct how we see and relate to nature. And that is what I decided to investigate philosophically, wholes and parts, substances and their processes. I have been questioning why humans are considered more important than animals 
and animals more important than plants when all organisms depend on each other for survival. Learning about biological systems and knowing that speciation is not determined by size or by intellectual hierarchy, I aim to examine the relations among parts within their systems and how these systems relate to a bigger whole, our environment, our world, nature. So in order to classify, we ought to consider individual properties, environmental conditions, and interactions. For example, observing an amoeba and a paramecium under the microscope, one wonders which one will endocytose the other. The fight of who will survive is 50-50. There is no particular advantage of one organism over the other. Another example is the human microbiome, which starts to develop at birth, and at an early age, it establishes a balance of viruses, bacteria, fungi, and protozoa. That helps us build our immune system, a balance that differs among individuals. If that balance is disturbed, we may exhibit symptoms. Our health depends, basically, on other organisms residing inside of us, in our body. Another example are frozen lakes. The frozen water migrates during the winter to the surface of the lake, allowing the rest of the lake water to be preserved in its liquid phase. This is how organisms in lake ecosystems can survive, only because of an exception in the properties of water. When water freezes, the, the density of its molecules decreases. Another current example is coronavirus. The spike proteins of the virus allow it to attach to specific sites and attack the human body. As of January 27th, the total deaths in the United States have reached 425k, which are more than the deaths Americans faced during World War II. So, viral behavior can be evidently more lethal for human populations than direct human conflict. And as we examine smaller organisms, and perhaps simple organisms in structure, we see that they might have larger effects on our environment. We also observe that nothing is stable, and evolution is proof of that. For example, there are Mexican blindfish that have lost their eyes in order to adapt to living in dark caves. This means that they evolved to have a body structure that does not require as much energy expenditure as it did before. It is in multiple ways that nature indicates that everything is a process and that inclusion is the most important prerequisite for observation. I adopted a way of thinking that James E. Lovelock presented in Gaia Hypothesis published in 1973, which states that in order for Earth to maintain homeostasis, we shall consider it a superorganism or a group that works as a whole. I also put a lot of thought in Louis Thomas's collection published in 1974, The Lives of a Cell, Notes of a Biology Watcher, where he explains that humans are a complex of living cells and each of these cells is comprised of different organelles that have a certain function. Those organelles serve the existence of the cell and if we scale up, Earth can be considered a cell and every organism that is part of it may be considered an organelle that has a certain function which serves and preserves the existence of Earth. With those two theories in mind, the idea of wholeness and parts, roles, purpose and morals became clear. But in order to define what a part is, I looked at the idea of substance, which would be the ultimate, ultimate part from which everything else consists of. I realized that these questions have existed for more than 2,000 years, with pre-Socratic philosophers being the first to question appearance and reality. Because when one speculates about human experience, 
one has to conclude that reality cannot be exactly like we experience it. In brief, appearance is how something appears to be, while reality is how something actually is. For example, Heraclitus asserted that the world exists as a coherent system in which change in one direction is balanced by a corresponding change in another direction. We observe that his view also includes the idea of wholeness. Another pre-Socratic philosopher, Parmenides, who took the view that nothing changes in reality, only our senses convey the appearance of change, also set the foundations for these questions to be made. Then Socrates, which he was the first one that set these claims in question for the philosophers that followed, he placed the moral agent at the center of his philosophy. Aristotle was the first one to give a systematic full set of answers to these questions in writing. So let's take a look at the four philosophers that structured my project and their thoughts on our position in the world. Aristotle is significant because he accepts the reality of ordinary objects as substantial, but our understanding of the world depends on what he names four causes. The central idea of his philosophy is his teleological view of nature, and reason is the means to human fulfillment. Aristotle was a rationalist empiricist that defined defined substance as all tangible things. He understood nature as a process and he used rationality to deliberate more on practical problems. His ethics and theory of four causes was his tool on fulfilling rationality and humans achieve their natural fulfillment by using their reason. The four causes refer to the four conditions of a substance. Material cause is the primary source and it refers to the substance something is made out of. Formal cause is the form something may take. Efficient cause is the primary source of change and it refers to the maker. And final cause is the ending goal. Aristotle's theological view of nature emphasizes telos which means the end, and explains why the final cause determines all others. What we, we would call a purpose or a goal or a direction of progression. Aristotle's teachings easily lead us to Spinoza's ethics, in which he emphasizes the whole and Aristotle's belief in the wholeness of nature. Spinoza is significant because he sees the sense in which only the whole of reality can be considered a substance, and this determines all the parts as its modes. To be more specific, Spinoza was a dogmatic rationalist. He believed that everything is determined by previously existing causes, and that God is the universe, the whole of reality. He is the only substance. God is comprised by its modes, which is everything else that exists, their essence, their body, and their mind. Spinoza believes that freedom is an illusion and that there is no choice, no final cause. Even though he rejects final causation, he includes it in his explanation of rational beings, as he believes that rational thought comes in partnership with other rational beings, and that does indicate a purpose. Leibniz pitted his monodology against Spinoza's theory of a substance. Leibniz is significant because he sees the sense in which every distinct element can be considered substance, and their perspectives are also determinative. This means that Leibniz a dogmatic rationalist, believed that the ultimate substance are monads. 
he believed that monads are complete and indivisible and that each individual monad has its own perception of the world. Leibniz's God has chosen the best possible world for the monads to exist in, and the world is the assembly of monads. Even though there can be no causal relations between monads, one can argue that relating their perspectives to each other is a purpose. All these theories regarding the importance of wholes and parts, purpose and individualism inevitably lead us to Kant. Kant was a critical rationalist who presented to us a rather positive view of nature and our position in the world. He believed that morality is the most strict rule of how we should think about our world. Kant is significant because his critical theory moves us beyond just saying that ordinary things are real, which is what Aristotle supported, and beyond God and nature being the only reality, which is what Spinoza argued, and beyond the idea of monads consisting the reality, like Leibniz presented. Kant's theory is based on how our experience is rationally constructed, which determines what we are dealing with, science, and how we should deal with it, ethics. Kant understood substance as a unified whole. He believed in synthesis and composition. He presented a structure that allowed us to think of ourselves as a part of the world, but at the same time, our interpretation of the world is realized while we're standing outside of it. According to him, reason is the most important tool we have, and God is a necessary, a necessary idea for the world to work and fulfill our rationality. Kant talked about determinant judgment, which is the objective framing of the subjective successions of our experiences of the natural world, and reflective judgment, which is the process of using the knowledge we have to make a sense of the world, of the whole. These two theories are of great importance as they allow us to have a purpose without believing uncritically in an anthropocentric teleological view of nature. Kant included in his, the in his works his theory, teleology, rationality, inclusion and participation he rationally separated our understanding of the world from what is actually there, but without undermining our intellect and our need for a purpose. In my opinion, we structure the world we live in and our choices determine that structure, which is a Kantian thought. We also have the need to communicate with other rational beings, an idea that Spinoza couldn't resist. And we ought to value everything that surrounds us, and participates, like Leibniz indicated, because without them, our reality would not be the same. All these conclusions cannot be established without agreeing with Aristotle's four causes, the source and the result of every action, and an undeniable need of a purpose, what he names teleology. One of the most important things is that science does not stand alone in this world. In order to be excellent in what we do, we have to accept all knowledge as one. Numbers are a very important tool, but results and conclusions follow an application in our natural world that impacts human behavior and nature. It is real to perceive nature as human resources, but our cognitive formations must be accompanied by an ethical position such as limitations of consumption as a means to eliminate exploitation. Our work does not stop in the lab and our interests shouldn't either. Thank you all for being here today. Dr. Toyota and the Honors Committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in the program. And everyone, please feel free to follow up with any questions or comments. We'll take some questions.
from every anyone? Does anyone have any questions for Eleni? What inspired me to write this book? Did you hear that, Eleni? Um, uh, yes, thank, thank you for the thank question. You for the question. Well, well, in a botany, botany course, course I took, I was faced with two articles that had an overview of the human microbiome. Um, the human microbiome is all the microbes that live in and on us. In that article, there was a comment on how we can use what we know about the human body. And it was said um, that ecologists often look at the dynamic interactions of the human microbiome in order to determine or predict relationships in the forest. So that got me thinking that biological systems in general may be portrayed in a bigger scale in order to provide input for our natural, natural world as we experience it. So the project was initiated from the idea of parts and halls, but it ended up um, showing the importance of final causes. And every philosopher seemed to believe in the interconnection of structure and purpose. And I thought that this is the way that, this is what it should be finally examined. And I believe in general, that every researcher should have the flexibility to adjust their project based on their Did I answer your question efficiently? Any other, other questions in the chat? Lady, in your thesis, I saw some watercolors. Those, is that your work? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? In your thesis, you had some watercolor prints. Is that, was that your work? Um, yes, yes, correct. That was my work. Um, I was inspired. So I was inspired by Agnes Martin. Um, she's one of the most influential painters of the post-war period. And she's an example of how we can participate in this world by creating our own ethics and incorporating them in our professions or in what we do in general, because she was influenced by Taoism and Buddhism. And after she have, after creating her own view of the world, um, she lived follow, following that particular ethics and incorporated them in her art. So I began to express myself through painting and art. Um, at the same time, I was writing the thesis and I believe that art may be the means to communicate your ideas. It is a form of language. Uh, Eleni, someone in the chat says, as we see in the climate change discussion, for many people it's hard to think ecologically and long term. Is there a helpful approach educationally drawing on Aristotle, Spinoza, Lebanese, or Kant? Um, so it is very, very important um, that what we do uh, can be incorporated in um, an individual level, but also affect things um, in a social and political way that include all of us. So um, the discussion about climate change is very important because it shows that the ecosystem that we have now, as it exists, it should not change. We should not lose the specific species that we have, and we should be able to sustain what we have. However, our examination of uh, the natural world shows us that everything is a process and there is a specific balance in nature, uh, but nothing is stable. So maybe in order to progress, we need to um, separate ourselves from the, these ideas and we shouldn't want to preserve what we already have. However, 
when we think in a, in an ethical way, like Aristotle's, Aristotle suggests and give us the foundation for that, um, we should say that um, we shall include and um, observe, respect and appreciate every species. So an ecological view of the world um, is definitely suggested, but stability is not. And one final question. Uh, Dr. McMaster asks, could you speculate on what one of these philosophers might say about animal rights? Um, let me think about it for a second. <laughs> well, I think that um, Kant would say, I, I specifically choose Kant because I believe that he um, looks, has a view of the world that incorporates um, the most important ideas of what the previous philosophers have said. Uh, but he would say that it's, uh, when we look at a specific uh, organism, we should consider their environment. We should consider how we have constructed the hall that this organism lives in. So for example, if we live in Mississippi um, and there are a lot of deer, uh, it's acceptable morally to perhaps hunt deer. And I know that this, um, this idea might be uh, criticized with a lot of arguments, but if we go to, if we observe the microcosmos, then we can see that under, like I suggested in my presentation, we can see that under a microscope, when we observing microorganism, microorganisms fighting each other, there is no particular law that makes one organism preserve, um, sustain, win over the other. So, we should not, um, we should always use our abilities, we should use our intellect, and we should distinguish ourselves as human beings for the uh, abilities that we have, but that shouldn't make us take advantage of other organisms, if that answers your question. Yes, that was perfect. Um, Let's give a hand for Eleni once again.
Hello. Um, the next presenter is Olivia Edwards presenting her honors thesis in economics. Hi, y'all. Welcome again to the honors conference. My name is Olivia, and my honors thesis is entitled Environmental Factors in Maternal Health in Mississippi from 2013 to 18, done in the Department of Economics under the guidance of Dr. Blakely Fender. So here's the bird's eye view of what my paper is all about. We know Mississippi has a lot of struggles with health care. And we know Mississippi is also really rural. And with Mississippi being so rural, there are a lot of disparities that come with that. You know, like rural areas are more likely to have higher unemployment rates, for example. And so I think a lot of this way that Mississippi is makes a really interesting case study into maternal health. Even more interesting, though, than the way that Mississippi is, is the fact that the institutions tasked with studying maternal health in Mississippi are politically limited to studying only the medical situation, which goes against just about every global best practice that is out there about studying maternal health. So the purpose of my paper is to close that gap to study the outside information and fulfill these global best practices. Which kind of leads to my research question, what factors external to the medical situation are related to the maternal deaths of Mississippi? So we'll talk about background of maternal mortality and what that is, the literature and methods, what I found, and some ideas for future research that I have. So maternal mortality, what is that? The World Health Organization, WHO, defines it as deaths related to or caused by complications from pregnancy or childbirth. And so if y'all would look at the map here, we see the maternal mortality rate charted in 2015 across all countries. And we can see there are really big disparities here between industrialized nations and those who are less industrialized. And so to combat this, the UN made Millennial Development Goals. And what those are, it's a really big group of goals that include things like solve world peace and world hunger. They're really big things. But what's really cool is that they chose to include maternal health in these goals to improve maternal health and reduce maternal mortality worldwide. And I think oftentimes maternal health and maternal mortality can be painted as a, like this feminist issue or it's a race issue. Well, it's not because at the end of the day, maternal health is an issue of ending deaths that are otherwise preventable. Around 80% of all maternal deaths are considered preventable on the retrospect of it. It's just like ending world hunger. Well, people die from malnutrition. That's a preventable death. <laughs> if, they weren't mal if they weren't malnourished, they wouldn't have died. So at the end of the day, it's just ending deaths that are otherwise preventable. And so I want to take a look again at this map. Let's look at the US here. We see that the US is darker than every single industrialized nation that is typically considered to be a peer of the United States. So we are ranked dead last compared to our peers in our maternal mortality rate. We do awful in that. So, in kind of thinking about the United States doing pretty awfully in maternal health, let's talk about Mississippi. Why Mississippi? In Louisiana, we have a joke. We say, thank God for Mississippi, because if it weren't for Mississippi, we'd be ranked dead last in everything. And so, in thinking about this and thinking about the United States not being so great in maternal health, a quote came to mind. It's often misattributed to William Faulkner, but it says, to understand the world, you must first understand a place like Mississippi. So I think that situation holds great here. Mississippi is consistently ranked last or close to last in nearly every health outcome metric and quality of life metric. As you can see here, I have a selected picture of Mississippi's scorecard. 50 healthcare, 46 education, 48 economy. And so why did I pick these? Well, there's this, these things called the social determinants of health. And what those are, are they're essentially the 
most theoretically sound way to quantify the outside environment. They are the conditions in which people are born, work, and live in. They are important to the individual and the community's health. So some further examples of what the social determinants of health might be, might be like the medium income of Jackson. It might be the air quality of Hines County. It can be the number of hospitals in DeSoto County. Those are some examples of what those things are. And so in researching further, I found what's called maternal health theory. And it essentially states that patterns of pregnancy outcomes need to be viewed across population types in a way that relates their location and time to their maternal health outcome. And so essentially, in other words, study the other stuff in tandem with the medical situation, what the World Health Organization recommends, what I'm doing here, what Mississippi does not do. And so other studies have used these social determinants of health to proxy for this outside situation. So in continuity of previous research, I also use those. So to start diving into what exactly I did. So I collected the maternal deaths from CDC data. And what that came with was the county, the year, the age, and the race of each mother who died from 2013 to 2018. And then at the county level, I collected data about the social determinants of health. And then I matched it to each maternal death based on the county and year to create that picture of what the mother's living situation, what her environment was like. Then finally, for my statistical methods, I used t-tests. So what that means basically is, say this side of the room had a certain air quality average and this side of the room had another air quality average. I compare the two and I see if there's a significant difference there. And say this side had a, it comes back significant. Then this side has a worse average. Then I can say this side on average does worse in air quality. So y'all will hear me say that a little bit. So to dive in, there were 61 deaths from 2013 to 2018. You can see them all plotted on this chart here. It happened across 38 counties of Mississippi's 82. And the deaths were split pretty evenly across white and African-American mothers. But what you don't see is that African-American mothers are disproportionately represented in this sample. What I mean by that is that African-Americans only make up 38% of Mississippi's population, yet they represent 50% of this population here. So that's issue one we have in Mississippi is that African-American mothers are disproportionately represented here. So next, the bread and butter of what I really did. I calculated a death rate for every single county in Mississippi, and then I sorted them into either a high death county or a low death county. And I compared all the social determinants of health against each other. I want you all to take a guess as to how many came back significant. For reference, I studied about 45. Take a guess, anyone? 30? 40? All right, well, here's the punchline. None of them came back significant. <laughs> so you might ask yourself, well, how did that happen? Well, I think something kind of funny when happened with the statistics. So Mississippi is so rural, I stated that earlier. And some of these rural counties were sorted high death and low death. And so in talking about those rural disparities I mentioned earlier, if there's a high death county and a low death rural county and they have the same unemployment rate, well then that's not gonna make the statistical test turn out significant, is it? It's not. So I kind of have a hypothesis as to how these rural counties got sorted into a high death and low death with a pretty even spread between the two. So patient transport policies. Essentially a common practice in maternal health is that patients who come into a rural hospital and they have a complication, the rural hospital will say, see you in Jackson, they'll ship them on down the line. And so I argue that the counties with low deaths 
are much better at transporting their patients than the counties with high deaths. This hypothesis that I have is further confirmed by the fact that every single woman in this sample died in her home county. In other words, no woman who was transported died in Mississippi. Then I wanted to look at some more rural areas and essentially I compared the rural deaths to the urban deaths. And the rural areas did worse in just about every known disparity that rural areas have. Education, commuting time, access to hospitals, labor workforce participation rates, median house value, all sorts of things they did worse in. But urban areas did worse in areas you'd expect them to, like air quality, divorce rates, and motor vehicle deaths. That makes sense. Next, I talked about, I wanted to compare the white deaths to the African American deaths since the African Americans were disproportionately represented. And funnily enough, the African Americans did worse in areas that there are studied and well-known racial disparities. For example, we see they did worse with education. They had less wealth. They had more diabetes. They had less food security, lower birth weights. But really interestingly, I want you all to look at the situations the white mothers were in. These are elective health behaviors, smoking, drinking, and number of opioid prescriptions written. This 110.25 opioids, that's written in per 100 people in a county. So that means 110 opioid prescriptions are on average being written per 100 people in these counties where white mothers died. That's a lot. And that's really interesting because there's a lot of research out there saying the opioid epidemic has disproportionately affected poor white rural Americans. And that's funny that that's kind of found here as well. And finally, you asked me, well, what do we do now? You didn't really have anything significant in the big part of your study. Well, first thing, we need to allow Mississippi institutions to study this in order to complete long-term surveillance on this. Secondly, well, you talk about patient transport. You might say, Olivia, there's a number one nationally ranked gold star telemedicine program run right down the street at UMMC. Then I say to you, why are we still transporting maternal patients then? It seems sufficient that telemedicine may not be enough for mothers for maternal care. And I think COVID-19 has presented a really interesting case study in that, that I hope further researchers can continue to look at. And finally, long-term improvement. These social determinants of health do not affect mothers in isolation. They affect everyone. They affect you, me, they affect your dog. So, you know, lowering crime rates. Well, that's a good for all of Mississippi, not just the mothers of Mississippi. So I think as Mississippi continues to grow and to improve, it's really important to keep an eye on it and allow these Mississippi institutions to study it to continue learning more about it. Do we have any questions? Julia? What inspired you to talk about this? Um, I kind of came across this in looking at healthcare economics. That's what I really like. So I found out about this fact that Mississippi institutions are not allowed to study this, and I was like, whoa, wait, that's really cool. I want to study this. So I think finding out that Mississippi wasn't allowed to study it really made me want to pursue it more. <laughs> so there are two institutions in Mississippi, the State Health Department and the Maternal Mortality Review Committee. They are both politically chartered by the state legislature. And written into their charter of the state legislature is the fact that they are not allowed to study this outside stuff. They are only allowed to examine the medical situation. And essentially their funding would be put at risk if they did choose to do so. Any other questions?
I have a question. Um, what would you have done differently with your project had COVID-19 not affected it? Well, great question, Anne-Marie. So, in speaking of the health department here, I was supposed to get some really incredible data from them. It would have been a lot more detailed and I would have probably been able to do a lot more powerful of a statistical analysis on it. I would have gotten the actual death certificate of each mother who died. So I would have been able to drill this down to the city, to even the street that this mother lived on. So it would have been a lot more powerful of analysis. I would have gotten more information on the circumstances of her death which is really unfortunate that I did not get that because COVID-19 unfortunately took all of their data analysts and put all the bandwidth of their data analysts into analyzing COVID-19 data. So I was not able to get the data from them. Okay, I have a question from Keith Dunn and he asked, can you define what qualifies as a maternal death in this study? 61 statewide over a five-year period seems really low to me perhaps i'm wrong mm -hmm. so a maternal death in this study specifically is a death relating to the complications directly from childbirth or pregnancy or a cause if you had a previous condition that was aggravated by pregnancy that's included also in it and yes it does seem low but we are actually ranked like number 42 in the country for our maternal mortality rate. So we do have a pretty high maternal mortality rate. You have to keep in mind the quote that I said about 80% of all deaths are considered preventable. So 80% of 61 of those deaths were considered preventable. And then um, the last question from Patrick Taylor. Um, might there be a relationship between maternal death rates and insurance rates, insurance rates in the country? I definitely think so, particularly in looking at actuarial science, the science that sets insurance rates. I'm sure that's something that they look at because with pregnancy complications, that's a really expensive insurance bill that an insurance company is going to have to pay out. So I'm sure that is a really big influence on actuarial rates and the rates that, is, that are then set for the insurance company. Can we give Olivia another round of applause? And we're going to have a break until 2.20, and there are refreshments outside if you would like.
Welcome back, everyone. Starting our next session is Beth Dowdy presenting her research in anthropology. She researched the impacts of the environment on the culture in St. James Parish, Louisiana. Thank you. Uh, my name is Beth, and I am presenting my research on the implications of the natural and built environment on the sustainability of the culture in Cancer Alley, but more specifically, St. James Parish, Louisiana, and it is titled Rising St. James. Okay, we're gonna start off with an activity. So, everyone close your eyes. Okay, first, I'm gonna ask you to imagine if you're my age that you're employed. Now that you have a job, pretend you wake up for your job in the morning and you have a little sniffle in your nose. Your nose is running a little bit, but you just kind of ignore it. Probably seasonal allergies, no big deal. You go about your day, you go to work, um, may, maybe spend a little extra time in the break room. Um, and then you go back home, nothing's really different. You still have that runny nose, but it's, it's no big deal, right? A week goes by and that runny nose turns into something a little more like painful and you're starting to think this doesn't really feel normal. Maybe I should take the day off and visit the doctor, see if something's going on. So you go to the doctor and the doctor says, ma'am um, or sir, you have some sores and some boils and some infections growing in your nose and throat and now you all want me to stop giving you this scenario so you can open your eyes um, as unpleasant as that scenario is this is the reality of a woman that i spoke to in saint james parish louisiana and being that i'm in anthropology i wanted to conduct an ethnography and part of that is really diving deep with the individuals that live there um, having conversations with them to understand what their daily lives look like um, what frames their culture, um, and the struggles that they go through on a daily basis. So throughout my presentation, I'm going to ask you to keep this woman in mind, um, keep stories like this in mind, and remember that from an outsider's perspective, it's easy to kind of um, ignore the situation and say, oh, it's just, you know, she's just being dramatic. But for this woman, it really did have an impact on her life. Um, she went to the doctor. Obviously, the doctor didn't have many answers for her, so she went to a specialist. And she went to doctor's visits and specialists for nearly a year and no one could give her an answer as to why she was having these concerns and these infections. And so eventually she gave up. And she lives in Cancer Alley, so she decided to take a different route to work. Instead of driving 10 minutes to work every day, she now drives an hour out of her way so she doesn't have to pass an open pile of sulfur, which she thought was causing the infection. Since then, that infection has gone away, but she can't prove that it was the sulfur and no one can really give her answers. So you can see how frustrating this may be. Um, and this is just one case of many in this area. Okay, we're gonna start off with a quote um, from Robert Bullard. He is the father of environmental justice, um, which we'll get into a little bit more later on, but I thought this quote really encompassed what I was looking into throughout my research. He said, when you don't protect the least in your society, you are placing everyone at risk. Justice will say, let's do fairness, equity, and justice to make sure that we do not somehow just say because you live in a low income neighborhood that you deserve, you don't deserve to have a park, a grocery store, or flood protection. Okay, so the outline of my research, we're gonna go into the focus of my research, the question that kind of framed the whole um, project, and then my methods, my literature and background, my data collection, and my findings and my conclusion. So the question that I was focusing on is how does the natural and built environment affect the sustainability of low income communities like Cancer Alley, but most specifically, St. James Parish. And you all are probably thinking, what does that even mean? Um, so we're gonna break that down a little bit um, more in a minute. Um, but this was kind of what I was focusing on, what framed my entire um, research. As far as my methods go, I began with observations and interviews. So like I said before, um, this was an ethnography, so it was largely qualitative, and I was looking to talk with individuals there um, and learn how they interact with their community and their everyday life. Um, so that means how they talk to one another, what they do and don't say, um, when they, what grocery store they go to. It can be as small as you know, what they do when they wake up in the morning. All of those things are really important to understand um, how they interact as a community and ultimately what their cultural framework looks like and their world looks like. And then I also use quantitative data collection um, to compare that to the qualitative interviews that I had and then mappings and findings. So I did interviews for about 10 weeks, um, interviews and observations and I interviewed about 10 respondents, um, some more than once, depending on the person. Okay, so we're gonna start off with kind of defining these terms. What even is a natural and built environment? So when I say environment, 
What are some words that come to mind? You can just throw them out. Okay, good. 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 Any more? Okay, so the environment, when you think of that, that might look different for everyone, but for my purposes of my research, I wanted to break that off into two different parts. So the natural environment is things like natural resources and clean water and air, all of those components. And then the built environment is access to resources like transportation, um, healthcare, schools, supermarkets, parks, all of those things, um, ultimately to see if these people can meet their basic needs based on the environment that they are surrounded with. Um, so then from there, we're going to talk about environmental justice and fence line communities. So environmental justice um, was started by Robert Bullard, and at the center of that um, was a thing called environmental racism. Um, and this has a lot to do with these fence line communities. These are neighborhoods that are disproportionately people of color that border petrochemical facilities. So as a result, they get the negative consequences of those petrochemical facilities, like noise, traffic, the chemical emissions, um, anything that the petrochemical, petrochemical facilities are putting out in the air, those people are having to breathe it in. Um, and like I said, he was an environmental sociologist in the 70s and 80s, and he found that contaminated sites like these were disproportionately located around communities that were higher percentages of minority group residents. The history of the environmental justice movement is very long, but for the purposes of this presentation, um, I'm just going to tell you how he defined environmental justice. So this means the fair treatment and involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, and national origin, on the implementation and development of policies regarding the environment. So what is Cancer Alley, and what does that even have to do with environmental justice? Cancer Alley is an 85-mile stretch between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. It borders the Mississippi River, and it has an abundance of petrochemical facilities. Does anyone want to guess how many there are? You can just say any number. Okay. Okay. There are 140 plus petrochemical facilities along this region. Um, and the history of land ownership is important here when you're understanding um, how this is a case of environmental justice and potentially environmental racism. Um, after the Civil War, the Freedmen, Freedmen's Bureau was set up to allocate land to newly freed slaves. So the new, newly freed slaves were given land um, that was on or near the plantations where they previously worked, which was along the Mississippi River. Then, in the 70s and 80s, or sorry, the 40s and 50s, um, this land had still been passed down through generations. And Louisiana was seeing an economic downturn. Um, and so they were looking for areas where they could improve the, the state of poverty in their state. Um, and they had an abundance of oil and natural resources. So they started offering large tax incentives to these industrial plants to try and get them to move here. Um, industrial plants wanted to avoid highly populated areas, so as a result, they started to settle along that industrial corridor um, where those people had been placed so many generations before. Then in the 70s and 80s, Kay Gaudette was a pharmacist in uh, St. Gabriel. She had just recently moved there, and she um, found that nearly one-third of pregnancies in St. Gabriel were resulting in a miscarriage. And St. Gabriel is near the top of the industrial corridor, and they had a lot of indu industrial um, facilities in the region already. And so this obviously lit a fire in the people that were living there to try and start to fight back um, and kind of join the environmental justice movement. Um, so as a result, they ended up incorporating the town in 1994, and they started to turn away more industrial plants as they tried to move in. This included the Wanu plant, and the Wanu plant moved their negotiations to St. James Parish, where I focused my research. St. James Parish um, is located in the middle of the Cancer Alley region. And it's broken up into districts, as most parishes are. And in the fifth district, there are eight petrochemical facilities already and half a dozen planned to be built. They have five out of the 10 largest petrochemical facilities in Louisiana in the fifth district alone. These illnesses that these uh, residents were starting to get obviously started to catch their attention. They started seeing more people around them getting cancer, um, and they started to grow worried. So grassroots organizations started to establish themselves to try and fight back. This included Rise St. James. Rise St. James was founded in 2018. It's still a fairly small grassroots organization, um, but part of their fight was against a company called Formosa Plastics. Formosa Plastics was not going to do great things to the region. Um, they were going to double the amount of toxic chemicals. They were going to put 13 million tons of carbon pollution each year into the air. Um, it was a $9.4 billion mega complex, but it was going to take up 2,400 acres 
and it was only one mile from an elementary school. It was also going to put out a carcinogen that has elevated cancer risks in nearly 100 census tracts already throughout the nation. This is a visualization of Cancer Alley, just so you can see. Um, the green line is the Mississippi River, so um, as you can see, those petrochemical facilities just border the Mississippi River, and then St. James Parish is outlined in the purple right there in the center. So now we're going to talk about my conversations, which was the bulk of my research. Um, one of the things that was brought up pretty frequently was the lack of data. So these people are trying to fight, but it's kind of hard to do so when you don't have any data that you can show government officials and say, this is what you're doing to me and my family. Um, and part of the problem with that is because the Louisiana Tumor Registry is not exactly the most accurate um, piece of data. So there is no distinction based on a resident's distance from the plants in the Louisiana Tumor Registry, and less populated areas are not even on the tumor registry itself. Also, low-income regions may not even be on it if they can't afford the health care. And it doesn't account for those that are impacted but develop tumors years after moving away. Additionally, the Louisiana Tumor Registry does say that Louisiana itself as a state has higher rates of cancer, but there is no distinction that that is within the industrial corridor. So the people can't argue um, that that is the case. And a lot of government officials will point to the fact that it is their lifestyle, and that's the reason why Louisiana has higher rates of cancer, which we'll get into in a second. Also, the EPA does not um, normally monitor the rare uh, carbon emissions that are cancerous. So although EPA may say that air quality is fine in this region, that might not necessarily be accurate because they're not really um, monitoring those emissions that are cancerous um, regularly. Also, the um, individual plants do have to report their data, uh, but the problem with that is the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality is not very quick on their response. So um, if they find out that a, can a plant is above its uh, allowed emission, then they have a time span that they can contact them. And the typical time span right now is about 20 months. So it's not exactly the quickest response. And then after that, um, the reprimanded uh, consequences don't come until about nine years. <laughs> So as you can see, there's a problem there um, as far as moving the issue along and trying to solve the problem. But the people there can see the issue. Um, they used to largely just subsistence farm, and that's how they had their, their living. That was a, a farming area to begin with. And now they can't even grow crops. So that was a problem that I heard a lot was, you know, our crops won't grow in our garden in our backyard. Um, but like I said, a lot of people point to the lifestyle excuse, and this is an issue in itself because, one, it's kind of hard to argue. It would take a very complex study to say that the lifestyle excuse isn't accurate. Um, you'd have to control for diet, smoking, alcohol consumption, genetic predisposition to cancer, your length and, ex uh, and extent of exposure to these chemicals, the chemicals' effects when they're mixed together, and the gestation period can be nearly 30 years long. Um, but the issue with the lifestyle excuse is it kind of just helps the government officials ignore the problem. Um, so they're not actually having to look into it if they just say, well, it's just the lifestyle of the people living there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about Formosa. Um, like I said, this was a plant that was trying to move in within the last couple of years. Um, and they actually, there are several issues that are related to this plant and several issues that the residents brought up to me. One of the first and most important is slave burial grounds were actually found on the property of the plant. Um, so Rye St. James was fighting to try and halt production so that they could look into this more. And to a certain extent, this has paid off because the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers actually suspended their permit in November of 2020. Additionally, they were getting a $1.5 billion tax break, which is taking away money from the schools and other governmental services in the region. Um, but people could say, well, they're offering employment opportunity, right? Not necessarily. Um, automation has increased significantly, which that in and of itself um, takes away jobs. And also it takes extensive training to get the jobs in the first place. Um, Formosa actually bought out a detention center when they came in, and they were going to turn that into dorms. So the people living there were also kind of confused as to why they would need dorms to bring in workers if they were planning on employing the people that were already there. Um, the slave burial grounds was the main focus of the argument, and finding burial grounds, this is not the first time it's happened. One of the individuals I spoke to actually found her grandmother's grave after not knowing where it was her entire, her entire childhood, and it was on the Shell Refinery land, which is obviously um, frustrating as a family member because now she has restricted access to visit those um, deceased family members. 
On a positive note, the fifth district in uh, St. James is where I focused a lot of my research because it's where the majority of the petrochemical facilities are and therefore where the loudest fight is being had. Um, but they were very uh, family oriented. They were all united in their fight, um, which was a positive thing to see. They gave out free meals during the pandemic to one another and they say they speak out for those who can't. So some of the concerns were a lack of supermarkets and um, other built environment things like public transportation. Um, the high school was recently moved out of that region. The post office was recently moved out of that region. And also in 2014, the region was moved from a residential region to residential slash future industrial, which just proves that they are trying to push out the people that are living there. Okay, so I also decided to include some numbers to kind of break down um, how, what this looked like by each district. Um, also, the poverty rate, the average poverty rate in this area is 16.8, which is actually below the Louisiana average of 19.0. So I wanted to break it down by census tract to see at the fourth and fifth district, we're seeing higher rates of poverty as a result of being the closest to the industrial plants. Um, and I also wanted to see if environmental racism was a problem here, so I broke it down um, by demographics. So anything that is in red um, is a population that is less than 57% white. Anything that is in green is a population that is higher than 77% white. Um, so the census tracts we're going to focus on, just so y'all can kind of keep your eye on them, is going to be four, five, and then three and seven. So three and seven are the majority white, and then four and five are going to be a majority black or African American. Okay, so when you look at these numbers, we're going to start with 404 and 405. Census tract 404 is 62.6% non-white, and the poverty rate is 34.4%. And then census tract 405 is 90.8% non-white, and the, the poverty rate is 32.8%. Also, something to mention, there was a 2006 study that actually looked into how many people were being employed in census tract 405, which has the most industrial plants. And at that time, only 12% of the people living there were actually being employed by the industry. Then census tract 403 and 407, um, for 403, the poverty rate is only 2.7%, but they employ 37% of the industrial workers. And then 407 is 7.6%. Specifically with uh, census tract 403, that also is where the one hospital is, the schools are, the parks are. Basically, anything you're looking for as far as the built environment goes, is go you're going to find that in census tract 403, which is your majority white region. Then I broke it down by demographics of population and poverty. So black or African American makes up 49.74% of the population, but the poverty rate is 24.53%. And then Hispanic makes up 1.8% and the poverty rate is 64.72%. Okay, so now these are my maps of the natural and built environment in St. James. Um, unfortunately, there's not much to say about the natural environment because there just isn't much data to look at. Um, there is no data regarding air quality in this region when you look into it, and there are um, areas where they locate water pollution in the area, but as you can see, that's, that's pretty scattered, so um, there just isn't much to say other than we know that uh, cancerous chemicals are being put out into the air. And then the built environment in St. James, I have uh, blocked out the 5th district, and as you can see, those um, gray squares are actually the industrial plants, so you can see them bordering the Mississippi River right there in the 5th district. And then if you look over where the um, green circles are, that's public parks, and that's where you'll find census tract 403. Um, and there's also the hospital, the schools, and absolutely no industrial plants are in census tract 403. Okay, so I also looked at the unemployment rate because a lot of the concerns were the built environment isn't meeting our needs, but I had a hard time actually seeing if the built environment has declined in recent years because um, there just isn't much data there. So I looked at unemployment to see if they were being employed by the region and therefore supported. And the unemployment rate in 2019 was 6.0, which of course is higher than the average for Louisiana and United States. And then population patterns, um, St. James there was a negative 0.45 um, population decrease. And then for Louisiana, there was an increase of 2.5. So even though people are coming into Louisiana, they're leaving St. James. So will they succeed or will they collapse in their fight? Um, so there are a lot of things that are working against them, um, beginning with the lack of data. So you can fight, they can fight as hard as they want, but 
Um, when the government isn't really supporting them with any type of health data or any study that shows this is actually impacting my health, it's hard for them to prove it and therefore it's easy to be ignored. Um, so if they had data that said, you know, my child has asthma at 10 times the rate, they could really use that and that has legs and the state really can't ignore that. Additionally, the lack of infrastructure, so not only are they not being employed, but they can't get their basic needs when the school is across the river. Um, you obviously need a car to be able to get there, and if you don't have the means to afford a car, with the poverty rate being so high, um, then you basically can't get to, get to school um, unless you're going to use the school bus, obviously. And then the location. It falls in the middle of Cancer Alley, so St. Gabriel, which I mentioned before, is actually near Baton Rouge. So if people aren't being employed or um, are having a hard time meeting their basic needs, they can go to Baton Rouge and find employment there. However, with St. James falling in the middle, there really isn't much room um, to find employment outside of the region unless you can find it in the region itself. But there are some positive sides. Um, the familial ties, so the familial ties to the land, with this land being passed down through generations, people feel a sense of pride associated with their home, and so they don't want to leave. Um, and so that encourages their fight. Additionally, the communal unity, um, everyone in the 5th District is pretty much united in the stance that they want to see change. Um, and so having that strong force behind uh, you as an individual is very encouraging. Also, faith and religion. So Rise St. James is a faith-based organization, so they feel that God has called them to have this fight, which also encourages them to continue fighting. So my projection, um, being a rural community does not necessarily mean that it's a failure. Obviously, there are plenty of uh, rural communities out there that are successful, but I would argue this isn't even a rural community anymore. Um, I think it's headed towards, to be, headed towards being a home for industrial plants and not so much people. Um, you can see this with the poverty rates, the unemployment rates, the migration out, the movement of businesses, and just the conversations I have with individuals. They do not feel supported here. They do not feel like it's a healthy place to live. And at this point, they're hanging on because it is their home. Um, and so they're going to continue the fight, but generally speaking, they do not feel like they're getting their needs met in this area. So that leads me to say that a lack of a built environment and natural environment that has been largely overtaken by chemicals and largely gone unmonitored um, leads me to say that the sustainability of culture in St. James is highly unlikely. But I wanted to end with this quote because like I said, I, I said over and over again, well, if, if you feel so you know, unsafe and you feel like this is really hurting your health, why do you want to stay? Um, why do you want to raise your children here? And they say, well, why do I want to stay because this is home? And so I want to take you all back to that um, scenario we had at the beginning of the presentation when I asked you to imagine that you just have a little sniffly nose. To us, that may not feel like that big of a deal, maybe an everyday thing, but to these people when they wake up with those minor health complications, that can mean a lot more. Um, it can mean that their environment is failing them, and it can also mean that they might be about to see the loss of their home. Um, so the weight of that means a lot more to them than it may mean to us. So I encourage you to just um, you know, stay plugged in with this and uh, really think about how this can affect um, the individuals that are living it every single day. Thank you. Any questions for Beth? So it's fairly small. Um, it's just probably about like 600, so not a lot, which is part of the problem. Um, the Louisiana Tumor Registry actually does not register um, low population areas. So a lot of these communities are pretty tiny. Um, as far as the 5th District goes, it's about 600 people. So they, they aren't really represented on the registry. OK, Keith Dunn asks, are are there any uni university research labs involved in any significant environmental research that might provide some data to directly identify health risks? Yes, so this is actually something pretty encouraging. Um, a lot of people have been giving attention to this issue recently. Um, I don't know if you all have been following, but um, President Biden has mentioned Cancer Alley and his environmental um, policies recently, so it has caught the attention of just mainstream media in general, but also um, the attention of universities. So LSU has an ongoing study um, looking into it, and also UNO um, has an ongoing study. And then I spoke with Dr. Barbara Allen, who works at Virginia Tech, and she actually has been living in France for about like two or three years. 
And she was doing a study there in an industrial corridor that is larger than the one in Louisiana. And she has found a way to do door-to-door -door surveys that would provide that health data that they need. So she's hoping to actually bring that to the whole state of Louisiana within the next year. Um, so hopefully we'll see some progress with that within the next year. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Beth. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so that's going to depend on who you talk to, obviously. Um, but the people that I spoke to, the first um, and most important is just acknowledgement. I think um, it's frustrating when you're seeing your family members um, pass away and, and you feel like it is a result of the environment that you're surrounded in and, and no one will really address it. So I think that's the first step. Um, after that, there have been several solutions raised, one being the, the halt of production for additional facilities, obviously. Um, the second being um, free cancer screenings, just something as simple as that would be very helpful, I think, to the region. Um, and then continued studies um, from different health organizations so that they can really see how it is impacting their health and um, hopefully take steps from there. Yeah. How difficult was it for you to have reports like actually talk to you? Were people like willing to speak with you or were they like, I'm willing to speak Yeah, so as far as like the people that actually lived there, um, they were very encouraged, they, they wanted to talk to me. Um, and I think that is that was the case I saw pretty much as far as like actual residents. Um, they were very happy to speak with me and to talk to me about it. Um, and they were super helpful. I, would, I mean, they would have like hour long conversations with me on the phone. Um, so they were very helpful, but the plants and government officials um, would never return my calls. <laughs> so I actually never got to a, span a chance to speak with them because every time I would call they would just um, tell me they would call me back. So that was not as encouraging. Um, and then there are also a few nonprofits that are working on it. Um, the Louisiana Bucket Brigade does a lot of work with them. Um, they partner with Rise St. James to help. Um, the Center for Environmental Coastal Quality does some work. So um, they were very helpful as well. Um, but yeah, as far as government officials and the plants go, they really didn't have an interest in speaking with me. All right. Any last questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I wonder if you could say something about, uh, you mentioned uh, some ethno ethnography that you aspire to. Uh, could you say a little something about that process? And, yeah. Uh, uh, the actual writing that you should Yeah, of course. So, um, first, I, I do have a pretty big interest in journalism to begin with. So um, I like that, that style of writing. Um, but also, uh, Philip Bourgeois wrote a, an ethnography that kind of um, offered the insight in, in the ethnographic process that wasn't just the interviews. So um, a lot of it before that was, you know, oh, I, this is what happened during my conversations. And he kind of gave the insight of like, well, this is what happened before I even got to the conversation. So for me, that was, you know, COVID. Obviously, I was trying to um, make alterations to fit the needs of the people that I was speaking to um, and just figure out what I was going to study um, with COVID and everything. So I thought that this was a unique opportunity for me to really show that side of the ethnographic process and kind of open my audience to um, that process. Um, so that's why I wrote it in that way. I wanted it to be um, a bit more informal in the sense that you got to see kind of the behind the scenes and you also got to see the, the interviews. Yeah. All right. Do we have time for one more? Was that a question? Yeah, so 100% my favorite part was talking to the people. Um, it was just a really interesting experience. Obviously, I wasn't really able to meet with them one-on-one -on -one in person that much, which was unfortunate, but um, I really loved being able to talk to the people and kind of create those relationships. Um, and they were very open and, you know, helpful along the way. Um, I also got to go to a few council meetings and meet them. Um, so that was nice. That was definitely my favorite part. Um, I would love to continue this research. I'm actually looking, hopefully, to go to graduate school. Um, so this is an area that I'm very interested in and I hope to continue. Awesome. Well, thank you, Beth. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Lauren Ladner, who is a music and creative writing major with dual concentrations in piano and voice. Her honors project, Translation versus Interpretation, combines these two disciplines for, by investigating the intersection of text and music in a choral context. Lauren inspires to be a choral conductor and is excited to present her honors research in March at the American Choral Directors Association National Conference. Lauren. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Lauren. This is my face. Um, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so my, you might notice a discrepancy between the program and my actual title because we ended up changing it to Choral Performance Practice. Um, and we will end up discussing that. Um, but this is a really big title, okay? Translation versus interpretation, a contextual analysis of the role of English translations in American choral performance practice. Um, a lot of these are very topic specific terms. So we're gonna kind of break those down a little bit. Um, so with a translation, it is the process, in the context of my paper, it is the process by which I'm, a musician translates a source text from an already written piece of music in another language into English and ensures that that text fix, fits the music that it originally came from. Interpretation is translation as art. Um, so this is where a musician thinks about all the musical stuff that goes into the piece that he or she is looking at. Um, and they endeavor to preserve all aspects of the source text when creating their translation. Um, the American choral tradition is just a contrast to the European choral tradition, um, of which the American choral tradition is like an outgrowth, because the European choral tradition has been way, way longer than ever. Um, <laughs> And the American choral tradition includes the distinct development of an American choral identity through discrete pedagogies. And performance practice um, is different from pedagogy. So pedagogy is the way that we teach somebody something new. Performance practice is the way that a musician realizes the piece of music that they're performing. Um, and that includes like historical considerations and like what kind of music, uh, bleh, what kind of instruments we're going to use and stuff like that. So that kind of breaks down the title for you. Um, so what is a translation? This is a literal translation that I made with Google Translate. And um, it is from Pablo Neruda's poem, Walking Around. And I took each individual word and put it in Google Translate and figured out what each individual word meant and put them in order. And this is what you get at the bottom. It happens that I get tired of being a man. <laughs> um, and so this is not an artistic translation. This is an artistic translation. This is an actual poet who sat down, did what I did just now, and then figured out how he could make it as close to the musical aspects, the sounds of Pablo Neruda's um, original piece. Um, so it's much more fancy steering my way in a water of wombs and ashes, like very poetic and beautiful. So what is a choral translation? A choral lyric translation takes into account both of these, the word for word and the artistic translation, and then adds this extra layer of music on top. So we have to consider what the words mean how the word itself creates a poem, and then how the poem itself fits into the music. So it's like God tier translation making. Um, this is a list of six things that a translation scholar drinker um, believed should be considered for a musical translation. Um, so we're preserving the notes, rhythm and phrasing of music, duh. Singable with the music, yes appropriate to the music, idiomatic and natural English. So in a lot of word for word translations, they're very clunky because we're just replacing each word with its English equivalent. That doesn't always make sense, especially in really far afield languages like Russian. If you make a word for word Russian translation, it's incomprehensible, okay? Um, so the idiomatic English just means that it's something that we would normally say. Um, it contains rhymes, so we preserve the rhyme scheme, and it reproduces the spirit and the meaning of the original, which basically is just we're trying to make sure that we understand Neruda's vision, and we are recreating Neruda's vision in a different language medium. So let's kind of put that into context. This is an excerpt from Haydn's cantata, The Seasons. Um, and so we have three 
translations, or three texts right here. We have German, we have Roberts, who, this is the newer translation, and then we have one by Gottfried von Sweiten. So something special about Haydn's The Season is that when he wrote it, he wrote it in German, and then his friend, von Sweiten, was like, hey, I know English a little bit. I will write the English part for you. And he did a really bad job, and everyone hated it, even Haydn. He wrote a letter to his friend where he said, I do not like this translation. So yeah, it's like in writing, he hated this English translation. Um, so when we're talking about the way that music fits into text and vice versa. We're looking at the natural rhythm of the measures themselves. So the measure is between this bar and this bar, this bar and this bar, it's right there. So this is a measure. Um, and this is in three, four, which means there's three beats to a measure. So it's like a waltz, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So the first beat, which is this one, is the most important beat. It gets the most stress. And in a good translation, we will conserve the text stress that the author wrote because it will be fitting with the text, ugh, with the stress in the measure. So in the German, it's un servatet si schlaf. So the si is the longest um, syllable in sisa. Um, so it gets the most stress, and it's on the downbeat. It's on the first beat of the measure. So this was a good German text. Um, and then down here we have an analysis between Roberts and Sveiten's text, and why Roberts is much better than Sveiten's. So in Roberts we have gentle sleep awaits us all. So we have gentle, which is right here. It goes to sleep, which is the most important word of the phrase, and it's on the downbeat, and it's on the longest notes. So the music and the text are linked in their desire to create um, emphasis on the word. And then awaits, waits is the longest syllable of awaits, and it is also on the downbeat. Sveitens is much less artistic. Um, so we have sweet sleep awaits us. Um, and the way that that is realized on the music is sweet sleep awake eight, eights up us. Um, his doesn't have as much movement towards the downbeat. So on the Roberts translation, we have gentle sleep. And on Sveitens, we have sweet sleep. And they don't necessarily like flow into each other logically. Um, so this is how we can realize the difference between what is considered a good translation and what is considered a bad translation. And that is just that the good translation lines up with the emphasis that music itself creates by virtue of its structure. So you could just kind of ignore all of those things and create an English text that mostly suits your needs. And this is when we enter the beginning of the 20th century in America. So basically, when we're at the beginning of the 20th century in America, we are all obsessed with Germany. We love Germany. German music is the best thing that has ever happened to us. It is so good. And all of the music that we sing in America is probably produced by a German person. And all of the musicians that are producing things in America went to Germany to learn about music and then came back to us to write American music in the German idiom. Um, so around this time, we also had publications creating translations of music without really like asking anybody what was going on. They just created texts to go with this music that weren't necessarily near the text, weren't necessarily in line with the composer's vision and stuff like that. And they were just publishing them, and they could do that because there weren't any copyright laws at the time, and they were making tons of money. And all of the scholars, such as Mr. Carl Engel here, said these translations are not good. We could do so much better than this. Um, and he actually wrote this. This is in the Musical Times, which is an American um, journal. And in this article, he basically flamed all of his colleagues for uh, thinking that using English translations was okay. They weren't 
okay, according to Carl. Um, so after this, we have American pedagogy start to emerge. We have F. Milius Christiansen, Williamson Finn Waring, Wilcox and all his friends, and we have Robert Shaw, who is the focus of my American pedagogy section of my paper. Um, Waring, the reason the arrow is between Waring and Robert Shaw is because Robert Shaw, or Waring taught Robert Shaw. <laughs> um, so the acapella choir movement basically means that towards the middle of the 20th century, there was a period of time where choral music came out of a hobbyist context and into a professional context. So choral music used to be relegated just to churches and schools. And during the acapella choir movement, F. Melius Christiansen went to St. Olaf Choir College and he said, I'm gonna make the coolest choir you've ever seen. And he made the coolest choir that America had ever seen. And they drove around and performed concerts and everyone was like, choir's cool? What are you talking about? And everybody wanted to make a choir after that. Um, so the acapella choir movement came out of that work with Christiansen. Um, Robert Shaw is the latest of these um, conductors. So he came around in the 50s and 60s. This is him. Um, <laughs> he is the arguably the most influential American choral conductor of the 20th century. Um, the thing that made Robert Shaw mo most important is that he actually toured around and he held workshops and he made a bunch of little Robert Shawlings to go out into the world and teach his ideas to everybody else. And he had a lot of ideas. Um, <laughs> he founded the Robert Shaw Chorale, which he named after himself. Um, he conducted the Cleveland and Atlanta symphonies and he was active from 41 to 99. Um, so Shaw's ideas as they relate to the context of my paper is that text was the most important part of a piece of choral music. Shaw believed that if, if there was a piece of choral music in the world, how is that different from symphonic music? Well, it's got words. So the word part must be the most important part of what that composer set out to do. Um, he also believed that foreign work should be performed in English. He thought that if you didn't understand the words um, as an, a native English speaker, then you weren't going to get the full force of the composer's amazing, awesome message. So it should be in English so that we know what they're saying, and then we can like totally appreciate what this guy wants to say to us. Um, Shaw also started to work on translations as a very like labor intensive process. Um, so where people used to just kind of scribble out something that was kind of close maybe to the original meaning of the text, Shaw was known to labor over every single word of a translation to make sure that it like fit absolutely perfect. And he actually died working on his last translation of the Brahms Requiem because he just like, he never thought it was finished. So it was kind of unfinished when he passed away in 99. Um, so now we're gonna get into the larger argument of what we talk about with translations today. So in the choral community, there's a lot of, not necessarily like shame, but judgment about whether or not a choral director will choose to use an English translation. Um, it is largely considered that if you're using an English translation, you're like wimping out because you could use the original text, but instead you're doing it this easy way. Um, so when you use a translation, that does actually give a choir several things more to work with than it would with a foreign translation. So you get accessibility. Your students, if I was a professor or whatever, your students and your audience would immediately be able to access the message of that music without me having to explain it to you. It also allows me to focus on other things. So instead of trying to teach them all how to speak German, and they're in eighth grade or something, and they'd never spoken German in their whole life, we can learn about making music, which is what we're really here to do as eighth graders. Um, it also streamlines the rehearsal process. Diction, you can ask any singer, foreign diction is just so grueling, and it takes so long to make sure that everybody knows how to say everything the exact same way. So 
if we're learning in English, we already all know how to speak English. So the rehearsal can go so much faster. We don't have to sit here and go, no, it's actually miserere instead of miserere. Um, <laughs> and we can learn more pieces in the same amount of time because we can go through rehearsal quicker. And we can realize English pieces more accurately. So what that means is if the piece is already in English, we're able to just know the sounds of English and how that plays into the sound of the piece as a whole. Whereas if we're learning a German piece and the, we don't really know German that well and maybe we mispronounce a couple of the words because we don't speak German, um, that is a less accurate realization of the composer's vision. So against, I spend a lot of time talking about the against of translations. Um, the biggest thing that I was exposed to that I didn't know before is that translations are an act of cultural imperialism, um, which basically means that when we translate a piece into English, we are saying that my comfort in the rehearsal space and my time in rehearsal is more important than your culture. Um, this is not necessarily as much of a big deal for European pieces. I'm sure that German people really don't care, like if we sing something in English. But um, translations become a lot more complex when there are pieces that are traditionally from South America or Africa or Asian cultures. When we translate those into English, it carries with it the weight of the privilege that we have over those communities. Um, it also limits the amount of music that's available to us. So if we are using translations, we can only use the pieces that already have a translation. Um, unless the conductor is really like into a certain piece and just wants to make a translation of it, most people are not gonna make a new translation for a piece unless there's one like already there for us to use. So it is inherently limiting if we're gonna use translations. It also is, it leaves less room for interpretation. So at the beginning I said that translation is an interpretive process. Um, if somebody has already done that for us by turning it into an English translation, then we don't have as much room as artists, musicians, to say what we really feel about the piece because somebody has already said that to us. Um, it also like prohibits this lack of understanding about the world. If, if I'm an eighth grader, I love being an eighth grader apparently. Um, if, if I'm an eighth grader and I'm walking through the, my like choir experience and everything I sing is in English, why would, why would I think it's any different when I go out into the world and I am like in another country or something and I'm like, why aren't all these signs in English? Like, I don't get this. Um, if we're constantly expecting the world to roll out the carpet for our Englishness or our Americanness, um, it's going to be a pretty rude awakening when we go somewhere else and they're just not like going to do that for us. <laughs> um, so it, it creates this lack of empathy for other cultures. It also inhibits the growth of both the chorus and the conductor. Um, so basically, this means that if we're going to ignore this whole aspect of choral technique, which is foreign diction, how to say foreign words, then we're not going to be able to reach our full potential. And it allows a choir to remain in their comfort zone, which kind of ties into this lack of growth. If we're not going to try anything hard, how are we going to get better? So what can we do? Um, my final piece of my project is arguing that translations are not bad inherently. Translations have a time and a place in someone's choral music education. They're like the training wheels. Like if we're gonna learn about music, let's not learn about music and Latin. Let's learn about music. Um, so we can use English translations in this way to just kind of allow us to focus on musicality and have lots of work available to us without necessarily having to like carry this burden of a foreign language on our backs. Um, I also urge choral conductors in my paper to release this judgment attached to the use of a translation. 
So choral music is the most accessible form of music in America. I read a statistic somewhere that something like 30% of Americans are involved in a choir somehow, just like through their church or through their community or through school. Like somebody somewhere has been in a choir in their life and it's so many of us do that. Um, so with that becomes that choral music is not a monolith, okay? I sing in the singers and the chamber singers, but I've also taught some first graders and they are, they are not the same level at all. And there's no way that I'd be able to do what is expected of a collegiate singer with first graders. There's just no way. Um, and so I might use a translation for those students just because, you know, maybe I really want to sing this piece. Um, but we wouldn't necessarily do the same thing as collegiate singers. So this judgment around whether or not, oh, well, you didn't use an English, like you used an English translation, like what's wrong with you? Like, you don't know that guy's life. You don't know that ensemble's life. Maybe they just really want to sing that song and have a good time. Um, so I really do urge conductors to kind of step away from this judgment about whether or not we choose to sing in English. Um, I have an appendix in my paper as well to um, give choral conductors some resources about what they're gonna do next. So one thing that's really funny about the choral conducting field is that some people who are in leadership positions in front of an ensemble never actually studied choral conducting while they were in school. They just studied like conducting with instrumentalists or they just like studied music and then found a choral conducting job at a church or something. And so they may not know how to do the things that I'm asking them to do. So I provide a really long list of like a bunch of different stuff that they can go find. And I just wanted to show that so that y'all knew if you wanted to know about choral conducting translations, I guess. Um, but yeah, so those are below and that's the end. Um, well, so like, that's another funny thing about translating is like, you don't have to be fluent in the language necessarily. Um, and I wouldn't consider Shaw fluent in any language. He did not know about any other language, like just in the way that it works. Like he basically did what I did where he went on like Google Translate in the seventies and, and he like, and he figured out like what the words meant. Um, additionally, with the Brahms Requiem, which I mentioned, that's like a really popular piece. So there were also other translations that he could look at at the time. So that could give him some hints as to like what he's supposed to be doing. Um, so you can pull out like this edition and that edition and get several people's opinions on what they thought Brahms was trying to say. And then, um, you know, Shaw was like, well, I'm going to do it better because I'm Robert. Um, and so yeah, I would not consider pretty much any music choral translator to be expected to be fluent in whatever language they were doing. Yes, Brenna. You talked about um, how important it is for performers themselves to have experience with and an understanding of the language and translations and stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about audience members? How, is, how important is it for them to have an understanding of modern language and translations? Right. So that's actually something that is addressed several different ways. So if you've ever been to a singer's, uh, not a singer's concert, but like a departmental, some of the musicians will be singing a piece that is in a foreign language. And when you open the little like program, it has the foreign language and then the translation next to it. So that's how a lot of people choose to resolve that problem. Um, you know, if we're gonna sing something in a foreign language, we'll just like throw the translation at you and you can kind of like look at it and just like get the message yourself. Um, Robert Shaw wasn't necessarily as into that. One of the biggest reasons for that was that that was when like radio was a huge deal. And he was like, he was dropping vinyls like left and right of like his chorale going around and singing lots of stuff. And if I'm listening to like my cassette in the car, 
of Robert Shaw Corral. I'm not gonna also have the translation like on my steering wheel. Um, so that was another reason why Robert Shaw was like, no, it must be in English always. Um, not to say that he didn't perform it in its original language, um, but in most of his recordings, it's usually in English. All right, well, I believe we have to wrap it up for time, but thank you, Lauren. Next up right now, we have Nathan Pyle, whose honors thesis is in creative writing, and he has written a fiction piece entitled Obsession. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, perfect. So as Lauren said, my entire project is a short story collection titled Obsession, and it focuses on the theme of obsession in four different ways, and I'm gonna read a foreword as well as an excerpt from one of my stories. Forward. Obsession is defined as the domination of one's thoughts or feelings by persistent idea, image, desire, etc. Total obsession to me is a fascinating concept. To take one's thoughts and feelings and controlled, make them controlled by one idea. Obsession has always had a negative connotation to it. To focus on one thing and one thing only is never a good idea. Obsession is something we all have whether exemplified through pestering text to fretting over how clean a house is. My obsession was, is, and always will be my writing. My obsession comes from the constant need to tell stories and to share them with the world. As a writer, it's, a, it's essential to read the works of other authors and read craft books that provide tips and information about writing as well as reading how these authors deal with the challenges they face. These authors can offer advice into, to a reading audience of antsy aspiring authors. Damn Fine Story was the first book I picked up for this short story collection. I've always enjoyed reading how other authors describe their creative processes in detail and how they may differ from my own. The most beautiful part about writing is how some basic rules and unnecessary regulations are broken. Wendig explains, no story conforms to a specific shape. Characters, as he goes on to describe, are everything. Characters drive the narrative. The character is the problem and the solution is the story. This mentioned by Wendig is such a unique way of describing how characters function within a story. Using one example in my first story, Sweetheart, we see that Mia is a profoundly emotional wreck after her girlfriend leaves her. Mia's character exists solely for the plot to evolve. Mia's character never goes anywhere and never advances in her universe without the plot holding her up. After picking up Wendig's damn fine story, I can certainly see the relatability in all the characters, even those who do heinous actions. As Wendig writes, you don't have to like the character's actions or even the characters themselves. But a crucial element of a good character is, quote, relatability. Anne Lamont's hilarious, reflective, bird by bird puts into words exactly how a writer feels from the time they get up in the morning to the grueling task of staring at the blank page, feeling all the energy suck from their soul. Throughout her book, Lamont looks from her teacher's notes and reflects on her life in an autobiographical way, imparting writing advice and handing out writing exercises that can spark a creative flow. One positive trait I learned from Lamont, one that I have struggled with my entire life, is the idea of perfectionism. There's an illusion, or what I would describe as a delusion, that many writers have that every version of the product they produce needs to be perfect. There are two different mindsets one must approach it. Just like some individuals are better at writing than editing or vice versa, a good writer must learn to do both, yet keep the actions separate. 
One advice that I learned throughout this creative process is that is, it is essential to write every day because sometimes the smallest scribble on paper can birth a whole new idea. As one of my favorite directors, David Lynch says, ideas are like fish. If you want to catch little fish, you can stay in the shallow water, but if you want to catch the big fish, you've got to go deeper. Down deep, the fish are more powerful and pure. They're huge and abstract, and they're very beautiful. Catching these fish, even the smallest fish, can be used to birth a new story, and that is my obsession. And now, I'd like to read an excerpt from one of my stories. When I was first hired, oh, by the way, this story is called Deep Fake. When I was first hired, I fell for him instantly. There were many old tasks at first. Fetch this, copy that, go get this, go get that. Can you please call this person? Schedule a meeting here for this time. But I didn't care. I would have done anything for him. After all, David was the best boss I could ask for. In the two years that I'd worked for him, I had gotten close with David. I saw him at his highs and his lows, and that day he was at his lowest. It was a normal Friday afternoon. It all started with one phone call. I heard the phone ring at my desk and picked it up. David was the only word I could make out. It was a woman's voice. The voice was hysterical. I couldn't tell what the woman was trying to communicate. Her responses to my questions were a jumbled mess of syllables that didn't even resemble English. The woman was insistent, though. She talked in a manner which I could only describe as manic. The woman didn't curse, but her voice was full of emotion to the point she was almost wailing, distorting the earpiece. Despite my attempts to calm her down, she was insistent. David, that's what the woman said. David, David. I felt bad for patching her through to him. David was such a sweet man. David truly didn't deserve the brashness of this caller. One second, please, I said, as calmly and professional as possible. I pushed a button and transferred the call to David. David shot a glance at and winked at me. He was so understanding, I thought to myself. Truly the greatest boss I could ever ask for. Through the glass, I could see all the color leave from David's face. He was erratic and pacing his office, circling his desk with a corded phone wrapped around his body. Honey, honey, what are you talking about? No, I, no, stop, just calm down. I could hear David talking through his closed office door. Talking turned to loud talking and then shouting, which turned to yelling. All the office employees stopped their work and listened to the chaos erupting from the manager's office. I felt somewhat guilty. All I could do was watch. David placed his hands on his forehead. Honey, whatever you've read isn't true. Pictures? What pictures? Of course not. Hello? Hello? David slammed down the phone and left his office in a hurry not even gathering his coat or briefcase. Lily, please take note of everyone who calls. I have to take care of something. I nodded slowly. David took off in a blind rush. That day, I received, it, I received at least 20 calls, some from David's family and some from absent gossipy coworkers. All of them had the same story. It was a combination of speculation and accusation. I politely told them that David wasn't in at the moment. Melanie, from the next desk beside me, approached my counter. Lily, did you hear about the rumors? She pursed her lips and made a <laughs> with her teeth. You got a lot of calls, huh? Hear them, I muttered. That's all anyone wants to talk about. I glanced down and saw the mess of st sticky notes all resembling fallen soldiers in combat. Piles upon piles of phone numbers, con contact info wanting to pry into David's personal life. This infatuation with others' personal lives and soiling the reputation of a good man like David was sickening. I just can't believe it. The boss was cheating with another woman, she laughed. I feel bad for his wife and kids. I frowned and continued to look at the post-it notes in front of me. All I could think about was the judgment of my other coworkers. I don't think David is that kind of man, I silently said. Well, there's photos of him with that blonde woman, 
How do you explain that? I knew deep in my heart that David wasn't that kind of man. In the two years that I had worked for him, I had never seen a negative trait. David was a kind, gentle soul who loved his wife and kids. He was always doing work for the local muscle dystrophy charity since his daughter was diagnosed. I respected him more than anyone else in the office. David isn't that kind of man, I repeated my sentiment. He wouldn't hurt a fly. Melanie shrugged her shoulders and walked away. At about lunchtime, David walked through the door. The entire office went silent. All the employees looked up from their desk and cubicles and quickly turned away. David had a frown across his face. His face was devoid of any expression. His eyes were red and his nose pink. He sniffed and cleared his throat before he stumbled out. <clears throat> Everyone, can I have your attention, please? David didn't even need to announce it. The office went silent as he walked through the doors. All that was heard were the, was the rare ring of a distant te telephone or the whispers between coworkers. I'm sure as most of you heard by now that the allegations that are being thrown against me, saying that I've been disloyal to my wife, my children, my family, there are photos of me circulating around social media with another woman. David shuddered and cleared his throat. These rumors and allegations are not true, and I will continue to maintain that. I wanted to address this as a group, but it seems as though whoever is doing this contacted the news about it, and for that, I apologize. I'm sorry if this incident has caused you any harm. Take the rest of the day off. I have to settle this issue. That is all. David walked back into his office silently. He shut his door and laid his head down. The entire floor was still silent. Nobody spoke up, and nobody dared to speak to one another. I picked up the post-it notes from my desk and headed into David's office. Mr. Fisher, I mean David, he turned up to look at me, standing in the doorway. Oh, hi, Lily. Just drop them off at my desk. I'll get to them later. He pointed at the mound of paperwork on his desk. I looked across his office. On all four sides, there were Bible quotes everywhere, some on canvas prints, and some with his daughters all standing together in a line. They looked like little angels. I envied David and his wife. He received a bunch of calls, 19, I think, all about, well, you know. The tension and awkwardness lingered in the air before he finally spoke. I just can't get over this. How did this happen? I mean, am I really this bad that someone feels the need to do this? David slid down in his chair. I mean, there's photos of me, not even of me, of someone who looks like me at a bar leaning in with some other woman. I've never even met this person before, never. And I never drink, never. So, you know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't take this out on you. I shook my head. No, David, no, it's fine. Honestly, David made a grunting noise and I cleared my throat. Maybe I can help you? David shook his head. His pale face turned to me and he had a hopeless look in his eyes. I continued. Like all technology, sometimes it can be used for evil. I haven't seen the photos, but from what people are describing, it sounds like someone might be trying to black blackmail you. Blackmail me? Why? What did I ever do to anyone? Nothing, I quickly corrected him. But someone may be out to get you. Get me? His voice was full of genuine concern. Like hurt me? Do you want me to help you? David sighed and gave a smirk at me. I suppose it wouldn't hurt. You know, you are the first person to believe me. You do believe me, don't you? I can assure you, David, you did nothing wrong. I grinned at him. I believe you, 100%. I turned around and smiled to myself as I shut his door. My twisted smile grew until my lips began to hurt. My plan is working perfectly. David would never suspect me. It's almost funny how easy it is to manipulate someone's photo to make them look like somewhere they aren't. And that's the end of my excerpt. Do we have any questions for Nathan now? Uh, 
What's my favorite piece that I've written? Um, probably my first story in this honors project. It was, it's titled Sweetheart. That's probably my favorite. Yes? Yeah, that's an interesting question about killing your darlings. Um, sometimes in the English department, we talk about killing our darlings as when we write something that really means a lot to us, sometimes it just doesn't work out. And I'm sure this is true in any other field, but I know, especially as a creative writer, that sometimes we have stories that just don't work out and when you kill that story or kind of place it to the side because it doesn't work out, it almost feels like you're losing part of yourself. And it can be very difficult to kind of cast it aside. But one thing that I found that, because I had a lot of ideas for these four stories and I had to trim some of them down to four, four stories. I think in total I had seven stories and it is difficult to kind of not share them with the world but knowing that I have that idea and that I can always come back to it later is very rewarding. We have a question here from Dr. Elise Smith. Mm -hmm. She says, in your own writing do you give precedence to the language of the individual sentence or to the larger structure or plot of the story? which requires more work for you during the editing process. Could you repeat that? Yeah. Do you give precedence to the language of the individual sentence or to the larger structure or plot of the story? And which requires more work for you during the editing process? So one thing I noticed that <clears throat> throughout this writing process is that it's very tempting to, while you're writing your first draft, to change it and I know I don't know if there's a technical term in, in like the in writing but I know in like music production there's something called ear fatigue which is when you record music you make sure you get everything you want to down at first and then take a break and come back to it before you start mixing it because while you edit it you may delete something or change something in that process that you'll never get back. And when you're writing and editing at the same time, sometimes that can happen as well. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, Liz. Now that you've completed this collection of short stories, can you tell us a little bit about what your next writing project is about? Mm -hmm. That is a really good question. Um, so currently, I'm a senior, of course, but I plan to go on to get my MFA in creative writing. And during that time, I would like to complete either another short story collection or like a novella that I've started. Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, I would say, if anything, it's become not a detriment, um, but it has made like the writing process feel more involved because I'm so aware of what I'm doing now that to make sure you get everything down that you want to, like I said, but going back to it, and taking the good things. I think during this process it's helped me realize that more, whereas before I would always try to edit while I work. Can we get one more round of applause for Nathan? Thank you.
We're now going to take a short intermission and we'll reconvene at 350.
Hi, welcome back to the Honors Conference. I'm excited to introduce Anne-Marie Lofton and her Honors Thesis in Math. Thank you. So um, my project is on the unimodality of the independence polynomial of trees using the generalized tree shift. And I know for some of you that sounds like a complete alien language, but hopefully I can shed a little light on it and hopefully get you to um, understand. Um, so my, the whole idea of my project started with Paul Erdős, who is a very, very famous mathematician. And so him and his colleagues made this conjecture in 1985. They said that the independence polynomial of a tree is unimodal. And so a conjecture is something that you haven't yet proven, but you believe to be true. So that is what I was trying to do. I'm trying to show that the independence polynomial of a tree is unimodal. And so the picture below is an example of a tree. So that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about throughout the whole um, presentation. So just some um, basic definitions. A graph for the sake of this presentation is a set of vertices and a set of edges. So if you look at this um, example, the vertices are all of the dots that are labeled and the edges are the lines in between them. So that's fun and then a path is a special kind of tree which is the tree shown above which basically is a straight line of edges and vertices. And then the degree of a vertex for, so if we looked at the vertex B, it's however many edges are going into that vertex. So the degree of B would be two, and the degree of A would be one, and ver <laughs> vertices of degree one have a special name and they're called leaves. And so an empty graph is a graph with no edges. So it would be like this if we just took all the lines away. So um, some more definitions. A partial order is a relationship that is reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. And a set with a partial order is exactly what it says. So you have a set of things with a partial order. And the, a totally ordered set is the same thing, but the elements in the set have the property of comparability, which means that either A is less than B, A is equal to B, or A is greater than B. So a unimodal polynomial, basically all this is saying is if you have a polynomial like the one in this example, then the coefficients go up and then go down. They don't alternate between up and down. So like this first polynomial is unimodal, it has one mode, which is 15, and it's the highest. But the second one is not because it goes up to 10, down to nine, back up to 12, and then down to four. So that is not unimodal. And if something is logarithmically concave or log concave, we are just gonna refer to that as unimodal also for this presentation. And so an independent set is a set of pairwise non-adjacent vertices, which all that means is if you have two vertices, they are not connected to each other with an edge. So like an example of an independent set would be the vertex B, G, H, D, and F, and they can be of any size. And the independence polynomial is shown below for this specific tree, and it puts together the sets of all independent sizes. So for this example, there are eight vertices. So there's eight independent sets of size one, 21 of size two, 23 of size three, 11 of four, and two of five. So throughout my whole project, we worked mainly with a shift called the generalized tree shift. So if we named this vertex X and this one Y, we are going to erase all of the edges that are connected to Y but not the one that's in between X and Y and give all of those vertices to X. So like this is an example of how that would happen. And so these are all of the trees on six vertices and there's a theorem that states if you start with the path which is at the top and you do a generalized tree shift on it and you get to the star which is at the bottom you will get all possible trees on that number of vertices. So that's what this is showing here. 
And for the rest of the presentation, if I say there is a tree T and a tree T prime, that's gonna mean that T prime was made from T in the shift. So like T of six one and T of six three. Um, and so if we have T and T prime, we say that T prime is greater than T and that imposes a partial order on the set of trees because the trees on this row have more leaves than the trees on this row. And that's true for all of the different levels. So the star, which was the one that kind of looked like a star, has the largest coefficients of the independence polynomial for trees on in vertices. Um, and so what this theorem is saying at the bottom, if you look at the example, you, we're gonna ignore the sets of size one and sets of size two, and I'll explain that later. But for the sets other than those, you can see that T and then T prime, you get there from the shift. All of the coefficients of the independence polynomial of T prime are greater than or equal to those of T. So that means you can get more independent sets, they can stay the same, but they never get lower in number. Um, so these are important for later. Um, so if G is a graph, any kind of graph, and W is a vertex in that graph, then the, you can find the independence polynomial of G by taking the independence polynomial of that graph minus a vertex plus X times the independence polynomial of that graph minus that vertex and its neighborhood. And I'll show a visual representation of that later. Um, and you can find the independence polynomial of an empty graph um, by one plus X to the N and the independence polynomial of a path can be found by this equation. So like I said, anything that is log concave is also unimodal. So if we have two functions, f, and, f of x and g of x, if they're both log concave, when you multiply them together, they're also log concave. And if one is log concave and one is unimodal, their product is unimodal as well. And so we know that the independence polynomial of all paths are also unimodal. So this is kind of the start of the new work that Dr. Nicholson and I did. Um, we wrote and proved these two lemmas. So like I said, we were gonna ignore the sets of size one and the sets of size two until, well, now. And so we proved that if a tree has n vertices, it always has n independent sets of size one. And that's what the first one says. And that is also true for sets of size two for trees on n vertices. So like for example, for trees with eight vertices, they always have eight independent sets of size one and 21 independent sets of size two. So this is how I spent most of my time. I looked at two different trees before and after the shift and I wrote and looked at all of the independent sets that were made, how they changed through the shift, and if some went away and just didn't come back after the shift. And so I ignored the sets of size one and two because they stay the same, and it was the count that mattered, but this helped on understanding how the shift works with the independence polynomial. And we wrote two lemmas and two conjectures from information like this. And we also wrote this lemma that says, if you have a tree on n vertices, the most the independence polynomial can gain after a shift is bounded by this equality. So if you subtract the independence polynomial of t prime minus the independence polynomial of t, that's always less than or equal to the independence polynomial of the star minus the independence polynomial of t. And we know that because the star always has the, the highest coefficients for every tree on that number of vertices. And so we weren't making much headway with trying to prove that all trees in this shift are unimodal, so we made a new one, which this is the definition of it, but I'm kind of going to just show you in a picture how we do that. So if we let this vertex be y and this one be x, we take this edge away and give it to x. And then this is how it kind of goes down the line. And as you can see, there's only one tree on each level 
So these the independence polynomials of these trees have that comparability um, property because it is a totally ordered set and not a partially ordered set. So when we are trying to prove this, we can induct on how many levels, how many shifts from the path that the tree is. Um, so this is our final proposition. So if we let T be a tree on N vertices made by this new shift that I just described, um, the following equation can find the independence polynomial of any tree that was made by the new shift. And that seemingly came out of nowhere, so I will explain it in a little more depth to you. Um, so if we remember this equation that I was talking about, and I told you I'd give you a visible, or a visible, a representation of it, this is that representation. So if we take away the vertex V, we are left with a path of size five and an empty graph of size two. And then if we take away V and all of its neighbors, we get a path of size four. So um, we can see that the left side of the picture um, results in a path of size five union, a empty set of size, or an empty graph of size two. And if we recall the figure of the new shift, we can kind of think a little bit harder and we see that generally we can get a path on n minus two minus i vertices and an empty graph of i plus one vertices. And using the equation or an equation for the union of two graphs and the equation for the independence polynomial of paths and the lemma for the independence polynomials of empty graphs, we get this for the first part of the equation. So this is one for empty graphs and this is the one for the paths that we get. And then for the second part, we use that same formula that we separated the trees with. And for the example that I did, we get a path of size four, but more generally, we would get a path on n minus three minus i vertices. And if we use the equation for the independence polynomials of the path and the original one that separates them, we get x times this very large summation. Um, so, both components of this equation are log concave, and as I stated by a previous lemma, the product of two log concave functions is also log concave, but we have this problem with the addition between them. And if we can figure out how to show that uh, the unimodality is preserved when we add these two components, then we can prove that the trees in the new shift are unimodal as we think they are. And that's all. Well, that was actually um, my mentor, Dr. Nicholson, came up with it and we kind of started working on it. Um, yeah, I think it was just something she had in her arsenal of unsolved problems. Cool. What portion of your project do you think was the hardest? Um, I would, I'm gonna go back and reference something. So I think this part was probably the hardest. So when you're trying to analyze something that's happening with a shift, you wanna keep all of the vertices the same when you move them. So you can see the independent sets changing and disappearing and coming up with new ones. So I think just, and doing it over and over and over and over again. Um, so I really think the hardest part was just keeping all of this straight and trying to gain new insight from what you find. You have a question from your virtual audience from Dr. Elise Smith. You were right, it is like a foreign language. I'm curious about how your presentation would have been different if you were speaking to a group of mathematicians. Oh, I, I thought about this one a lot when I was getting ready for this. Um, presentation it would it would be a lot different and I am really thankful for this opportunity to get to talk to people that aren't necessarily all like care about math like I do and it helps me 
think about how and what I need to change to get people to really understand. So if I was talking to a group of mathematicians about this project, I would definitely skip most of the definitions and just the definitions that are very um, project specific. And I would keep a lot of the language for the definitions that I took out for this presentation that I just really put in for lack of a better word, like layman's terms, without all the math language with them. Well, let's give another hand for Anne Marie. Oh, oh okay. Um, Laura will be presenting her honors in creative writing entitled Cell Phone Trial, a commentary on the on the health of my environment, mind, society. Lauren's honors focuses on the intersectionality of research and self-experiences and ultimately recognizing that just because we have our own physical, mental, and social adversities does not mean we are dealing with this alone. All right, <laughs> my name is Lauren Singleton, and the title of my thesis is Cell Phone Trial, a commentary on the health of my environment, mind, and society. So I wanna start off by reading you an excerpt from my first essay in my collection entitled An Open Letter to the Residents of Washington County, Alabama. And those are some photos that I took of the Tom Bigby River at Peavy's Landing that I thought would be a nice visual for my reading. I understand why Native Americans believed in the soul healing powers of water, and you would too if you'd ever felt the gentle tug of the Tom Bigby current rocking you into relaxation the way I have. When we were all younger, we liked to swim at noonday at the apex of sunshine, but as we got older, we more valued an afternoon dip, about 4 p.m., after the scorching sun rays had subsided and cool breezes rolled in alongside the thunderstorm clouds. Oftentimes, we would find ourselves swimming in a rainstorm. There's nothing like it. Raindrops patter against the sand, forming little wet clumps as proof of their arrival. The rain itself is much colder than the river water, so you duck your shoulders down under the water's edge. Droplets splatter into your eyes as they bounce up from their contact with the water, so you close your eyes. There's nothing to see but blackness, so your ears perk up, and suddenly you hear every interaction around you. Rain against water, bird wings flapping in the trees up the hill, soft sloshes of small waves on the sandbar. Underwater, your toes dig into the sand, scattering grains through the water up onto your shins. Soft prickles dance along your skin from their touch. A minnow nibbles on your knee. There's nothing on earth between you and the full embrace of nature, and yet you don't understand the complexity of the moment until years later when you write about it. You don't understand how important it was to feel the warm water and cold rain on your shoulders or why it mattered that you closed your eyes. You only knew what your instincts told you and yet somehow you knew so much more by thinking so little. So I've written a collection of nonfiction essays, each of them aiming to unravel my personal commentary on the various aspects of my life, my environment, my mind, and my society. So now that you've heard a little bit of my writing, I wanna explain a little bit about the genre of creative nonfiction. So on the slide, I have listed the three branches of creative writing, fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. Um, and fiction is pretty straightforward. We all understand what it is that I mean when I say that I write fiction. I mean that I write scenes and plots and I create characters um, and I tell you a story. And we all know what it means whenever I say I write poetry. I write in stanzas and lines, and I consider the rhythmic patterns of all of my words. But what is it that I mean whenever I say I write creative nonfiction? That's what I want to tell you today. So basically, the coolest thing about creative nonfiction to me is that it takes the most entertaining aspects of fiction, like creating dialogue and characters and all these beautiful scenes, and it merges them together with the greatest aspects of nonfiction writing, which is an information-based tale. Um, and it combines factual research with amazing fiction characteristics. 
And so that's why I chose to write in the creative nonfiction genre is because I wanted to write about my own personal experiences while also giving you research. So whenever I began my thesis, I had to choose what topics I wanted to write about. And the way I made this decision was looking back through my personal memories and identifying ones that did not sit right with me and ones that I felt like I needed to unpack further. So once I had those memories picked out, it was all about me figuring out what broad topics they fit into and then reading literature on those topics. So what I chose is climate change, depression, and social justice. Um, but before I read on those specific topics, I began researching the genre of creative nonfiction itself. Um, and above on the slide, you can see some of the, this is not a comprehensive list, but some of the pieces that I read for each topic um, that really gave me a great footing before I started my own writing. So now, for the bulk of my presentation, I want to read you some of the results of my thesis. So I'm going to be reading a chunk of my essay, Soul Constriction, which talks about my experience with depression. And since it's a pretty heavy topic, I've included a trigger warning because there are some graphic imagery and mental health is always a touchy subject. So I'm going to read for you. The dog's collar jingles as he scratches his neck with his back paw. My eyes crack open, only a sliver at first and then fully. Warning, Maxie, I say to him, reaching over to pet his soft head. He pants at me. I wipe sleep from my eyes and roll over to face CJ beside me. He's still sleeping. I snuggle next to his side and place his arm underneath my head, wrapping my legs in his and laying my head on his shoulder. I plaster his cheek with little kisses until he stirs awake, sleepily kissing my lips before dozing off again. I can feel his steady breathing, hear his heartbeat. Max snuggles against me so that I'm now in a sandwich. His fur is warm and soft against my bare back, his breaths more jagged than CJ's. The sun is breaking through the yellow curtains across the room. The ceiling fan creaks and groans as it turns overhead. CJ's leg hair tickles mine underneath the comforter. My breathing slows and I feel my shoulders relaxing. My eyes flicker closed. I awaken again to an empty bed. CJ has already risen for the day, Max following with him. I call out for CJ, but he does not answer. I roll over and wrap myself in the comforter. I want to get up and go find him, but there are too many things I would have to do first. I can't walk through the house naked. My hair hasn't been combed. I need socks before walking on the cold hardwood. I decide to lie there and wait for his return. Surely he'll come back for me soon, asking what I want for breakfast. The fan is still creaking above me, the only sound in an otherwise silent house. I lie on my back and watch the blades turn round and round. I hear a car zoom by outside the window. I want to get up. I want to get my day off on the right foot. I want to feel blades of grass underfoot as I play fetch with Max, but there seem to be iron chains anchoring me to the bed. My stomach rumbles and I feel tears welling up, threatening to spill over. No, I think to myself, you will not cry. There is absolutely no reason to be upset. Get up if you're so concerned but I know I can't get up. SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, work by targeting serotonin, a neurotransmitter that, among others, influences mood. When serotonin is released from synapses in the brain, it hangs around for a while to, either, to be either accepted into other neurons or reabsorbed into the synapses. If it's accepted into other neurons the way it's supposed to, it has a regulatory effect on mood. If it's reabsorbed by the body before enough can get into other neurons, depressive mood can be triggered. That's where SSRIs come into play. Basically, they interfere with the absorption process to make serotonin hang around longer near the neurons, giving another chance for them to be properly processed. If more is processed, one's mood can be regulated. In terms I appreciate due to candor, happy pill makes brain eat more serotonin instead of chucking the excess in the trash. More serotonin equals happier Lauren. While antidepressants are lifesavers, literally, they are not magic pills to solve every issue and make depression disappear. The symptoms still linger, and one can actually experience an upswing in depressive symptoms during the first two weeks of taking an antidepressant. The pill's purpose is to treat, not cure depression. At the beginning, it might seem pointless to take the meds because it's a guessing game to get on the right drug and the right dosage. 
I understand just how frustrating it can be as someone who swapped antidepressants once and dosages three or four times. Treatment with antidepressants is most successful actually when taken alongside undergoing CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. This type of therapy focuses on coping with the symptoms of depression and retraining the brain on helpful versus harmful ways of thinking. The point is, antidepressants can't solve everything, but they are a major player in the fight against depression. Antidepressants don't make depression disappear, and they don't cure it at its source, but they help manage the symptoms. As someone who is skeptical about needing medication to begin with, let me make it clear just how valuable medication is. I would not be alive today if I hadn't been taking Paxil during my depressive episode. There were many, many dark days when suicide crossed my mind, and I can only imagine how much darker it would have been without medication. And, though I mentioned that antidepressants work best alongside CBT, I myself didn't even start going to therapy until the latter half of my episode. I'm glad I went, though, because my therapist has been so affirming to talk to. I understand that what I'm feeling is legitimate and valid, and that's what's happening to me is real. She helps me see that I'm not crazy. The science and treatment behind depression are not exact, as the brain is an elusive and mysterious creature, but I am thankful for the help I've received and the knowledge I've gained along my journey with depression on my back. I know depression is something I'll deal with for likely the rest of my life, so as we as people progress forward in life, I hope we all as a society become more aware and supportive of mental disorders and their affected parties. It's amazing how much a little empathy can do. The theater is packed and there's no time to buy snacks. CJ and I find his friends, quickly greet them, and settle into our terrible seats just in time for the movie to start. He apologizes for our tardiness and squeezes my hand in encouragement. We watch the movie, How to Train Your Dragon 3, and decide to go for dinner afterwards at Steak and Shake. Haley and Crystal, CJ's friends, settle in across from CJ and me in our booth. How'd you like the movie, guys? Crystal asks. It was awesome. I can't believe that Toothless and Light Fury had such cute babies. I definitely want to steal those dragons, I say. Everyone orders food except me. I get a banana milkshake. Okay, well if you decide you're hungry when the food gets here, I'm not sharing, CJ says, smirking and elbowing me in my arm. My legs start to feel sweaty against the vinyl seat. I think of my mom and my house and my bed, and I feel myself start to shut down. The whole time during the movie, I was distracted, but now it's like everything is bearing twice as heavily upon my soul to make up for lost time. I scoot closer to CJ and wrap my arm through his. It sounds crazy, but he's my anchor right now. Physically touching him keeps me from mentally floating away. CJ and his friends continue talking, and they ask us questions about how we met and how our weekend has been. CJ intercepts and does all the talking. He's very good at noticing the glazed look in my eyes when I start to check out. We eat and exchange pleasantries before parting ways. I climb into the passenger seat and curl my legs up to my chest. Without a word, CJ adjusts the mirrors, puts it in reverse, and gets us on the road. I want to go back and stay at your house, I say. You know you've got class in the morning. Please? He sighs. Lauren, okay. I'm silent for a long while, mulling over my thoughts. Nothing feels like home except CJ. Crucify me for being that girlfriend if you must, but it's the truth. I associate a kind of steadiness with him that's now a staple in my life. I just need it. He's the only person that is consistently there for me, and I want to soak up that love for as long as I can. I begin to cry, ragged, snotty exhalations, the kind that signify deep pain. I cry for the remainder of the hour-long drive back to his house. I can't give you an exact reason why, but I know it's depression's fault. Depression is a deeply rooted pain that grows no fruit. The roots engulf the expanse of my being, but there is no stem to grasp for removal. I can't pluck this weed. Its roots wrap so firmly around my soul that if I could snatch it out, so too would I rip out my soul. So on that very cheery note, that's all I have for you today. Um, but I want to say a huge, huge thank you to both Dr. Pickard and Dr. McMaster, um, who dedicated so much time and energy to helping me write and develop these words. 
And also to Dr. Toyota, who is my third reader, <laughs> and um, Dr. Groundhouse, Dr. Sherinian, Dr. Selman, and Dr. Desutter, who all contributed in various ways to helping me get the research um, literature that I needed to write this. So that's all. Are there any questions? Ariel? The hardest part about doing all of this was knowing that I was going to have to talk about it. <laughs> um, because writing it is a completely different ball game. I can pour my soul out onto a piece of paper and it's like, there it is, it's going to stay there. But having to talk about it is a lot, a lot harder. So other than like knowing that this was going to happen, <laughs> that, was, that was the hardest thing, is knowing I was going to have to speak. <laughs> I thought a lot about that because in total I wrote like 57 pages I think and so like a lot of it was Dr. Pickard he was like these are the strongest pieces I think you should look at this one and so that's why I chose a big chunk is because I think that's my strongest essay. Yeah. You have a comment from Dr. Elise Smith, Lauren your writing is so dependent on description of, of, to create mood, how much do you feel free to play around with the truth? in your creative nonfiction, especially in specific details? That's a really interesting question because a lot of the uh, discussion in creative nonfiction is where, how much truth do you tell and how much of it do you write as fiction? Um, so that's a really good question. And a lot of my own writing, I would put it all on the paper and then I would have to go back and read it and say, is that actually how it happened? Or did, did I remember it wrong? Or am I being totally truthful? Um, but yeah, I do definitely write heavily descriptive pieces. So a lot of the specific details, like the yellow curtains, that's true. But um, whether or not we spoke those specific words, it's not like I had a recorder, so I <laughs> made things up that seemed to fit the situation. And that's what I think is one of the coolest things about creative nonfiction in particular. I have a question. Yeah. During your process, did you ever want to like stop writing and kind of back out because of the amount of vulnerability you were doing at the time of like writing? I don't know if I ever wanted to back out because writing what I wrote for this is exactly what I want to do like with my life. Um, but there were definitely times when I would meet with Dr. Pickard and I would talk about like what I've written and get feedback on my writing and it felt like I was ripping out like a piece of my soul and saying, here, is it good? Um, that was really difficult because what I write about is not necessarily like happy, cheery table talk. It's like we're now mentally connected and you know my heart and soul because you've read all about me. <laughs> yeah. The science was way harder um, because writing, I can do that. I got you, I got that. But the science, um, that's why I thanked all these people on this slide because Dr. Groundhouse, my piece on depression, Dr. Groundhouse read through all of it and was like, this is accurate or maybe you should revisit this or here's an article on this. And then Dr. Selman, I wrote an environmental piece and I spoke with him and he gave me lots of information. So by far, science is way harder, to me at least. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you to Lauren.
Up next is Rachel Switzer. Rachel Switzer is a communication studies and English major with a minor in creative writing. Her honors project, Translating the Enigma of Daisy Buchanan to Film, combines her interests in digital media and literary criticism as she studies the interpretive dis differences between the two major film adaptations of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Hello, and thank you for being here this evening as Lauren so kindly introduced. My name is Rachel Switzer, and my honors thesis is titled A Beautiful Little Fool, Translating the Enigma of Daisy Buchanan to Film. Uh, this focuses on, the, on two different interpretations of Daisy, and it's under the advisement of Dr. Anne McMaster. So the 1925 novel, The Great Gatsby, has seen a total of five different adaptations to film. And today I will be focusing on the two most popular adaptations. That is the 1974 movie directed by Jack Clayton, starring Robert Redford and Mia Farrow. And then the 2013 adaptation, which stars Leonardo DiCaprio and Carey Mulligan. When watching both of these movies, they can't be faulted for their technical accuracy. In both movies, the dialogue is oftentimes taken directly from the page. The way the story proceeds scene by scene is almost identical to how the story proceeds in the book. When watching these movies, they have very strong stylistic differences and different ways of interpreting Fitzgerald's original story and text. And I will be focusing on the character of Daisy Buchanan because she's a wonderful way to understand how these directors interpret this story to film. Daisy is possibly one of the most complicated and opaque characters to exist in American literature. She's a very complicated character to understand in the book, let alone understand and therefore adapt into film. So my research question became, what are the differences between these two movies and what can their differences tell us? What can these differences tell us about adapting film or about women in film or about Fitzgerald's original text? I came to the conclusion that um, Jack Clayton's 1974 movie leaves a lot more room for multiple interpretations and therefore a lot more room for the ambiguity that exists in Fitzgerald's original text, which makes it such a wonderful example of modernist literature. Baz Luhrmann's film, on the other hand, favors a much more simplified narrative and um, simplified characterizations that ultimately leave a lot less space for multiple interpretations. However, though Jack Clayton's movie allows more ambiguity within his storytelling, both films really struggle to fully embody the contradictory nature of Fitzgerald's original novel. So the best way to discuss film is having the common uh, frame of reference of having seen it. So I will be showing two scenes today and comparing them. So the first one is from the 1974 movie. This is Daisy's first appearance, and she is played by Mia Farrow. So there are two things I want to focus on in this scene here. The first is this um, idea of passivity. When we first see a Daisy on the screen, as you can see in this first image here, she's very far away from the viewer, far away from the camera, lying in this very passive position. We don't even see her, see her until the two men cross the screen. And so in this passive position, it corresponds symbolically to this idea of the active male, passive female binary that exists within uh, film theory. 
So Daisy is not really a strong agent of action in the movie. Um, any major decisions or actions um, on her part that would have a strong influence on the story happens off screen if they happen at all. So she doesn't really make things happen, things happen to her. Another thing is this idea of performativity. Uh, Mia Farrow's performance in this movie has been pretty heavily criticized. A lot of critics call her performance shallow and empty and narcissistic. Um, and I would argue um, that this is because of this idea within a performance within a performance. If you look back at the original text here on the screen when Fitzgerald writes about this scene specifically, the language that he uses implies a self-awareness on Daisy's part of the social role that she is expected to play. As a woman of wealth and a wealthy wife, there is a very specific way that she's expected to act and behave. And so any shallowness that may be there on Daisy's part is because she is playing a role. So there's a role within a role in that sense. All right, now moving on, this is the same scene, but in the 2013 movie directed by Baz Luhrmann, where Carrie Mulligan plays Daisy. Pay attention to the stylistic differences and also to the voiceover narration. golden girl. A breathless warmth flowed from her, a promise that there was no one else in the world she so wanted to see. Do they miss me in Chicago? Uh, yes, um, um, at least a dozen people send their love. How gorgeous. They're absolutely in mourning. They're crying. No, yes, they're I wailing. They're I don't screaming. believe They're They're shouting, Daisy Buchanan, we can't live without you. I'm paralyzed with happiness. Whoa! 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 <laughs> oh. Jordan Baker, a very famous golfer. Oh. She was the most frightening person I'd ever seen. Well, I've, I've seen your face on the cover of Sporting Life. Nick Carraway. But I enjoyed looking at her. I've been lying on that sofa for as long as I can remember. This summer, I'll sort of fling you two together. I'll push you into linen closets and out to sea in boats. I'm not listening to a word. So, Nick. Daisy tells me that you're over in West Hack, throwing your lot in with those social climbing primitive new money types. My little shack's just a cardboard box at 80 a month. Your life is adorable. I know somebody in West Hack. I don't know a single person that side of the bay. Oh, you must know Gatsby. Gatsby? What Gatsby? Madame, the dinner is savvy. There's a very strong tonal difference in this movie. Uh, Lorman's trademark style is very cinematic, very grand, very energetic, in a way that Jack Clayton's movie just simply is not. Um, but focusing on the very first appearance of Daisy that's unobscured by the curtains, you, the first thing you see is her hand hanging over the couch, and the eye is immediately drawn to this huge diamond ring on her finger. And this signifies the two things that I guess are essential to her character and that is her wealth, as extremely wealthy, and then her marriage. She's a married woman to a very wealthy man. Then the camera pans up and we see her face. And before she has much of a chance to say anything so the audience can say for themselves who she is, we have Nick's narration come in telling us who she is. She is the golden girl, a breathless warmth flows through her. So this narration immediately tells us who she is, or at least who we should expect her to be, rather than letting us experience for ourselves who she is. Now drawing from Laura Mulvey's idea of close-ups, close-ups are featured very prominently in both of these movies, and I believe they hold a lot of symbolic significance. Laura Mulvey argues that these fragmented uh, frames of women's bodies destroys the Renaissance space, she says. And so I would argue in this way, as we are unable to 
quite literally see um, Daisy in, the, in her entirety. This sort of stands in for the fact that we don't really know her in her entirety. She's unable to exist as a full uh, human being on the screen. So going back over these differences we've noticed in these scenes and applying it in a broader context to the entire films, Mia Farrow has this idea of, once again, a performance within a performance. But because that line is blurred between the acting Daisy and then the real Daisy, it allows for multiple interpretations. Upon one viewing, you can get the impression that she is very selfish and shallow and narcissistic and cold. And then in the next viewing, she's very witty and very charming, and you do feel bad for her and the situation she has been placed in. Clayton allows her to exist in complexity. Meanwhile, in Lerman's movie, the narrative guides us really heavily through the voiceover that Nick gives. And so this voiceover biases us to interpret the movie in a specific way as we watch it. Uh, Carrie Mulligan's Daisy is also a lot more genuine, and Lorman builds her up to be a very surprisingly sympathetic character. But in making her such a symp sympathetic character from the beginning, the way the story progresses, unfortunately, The Great Gatsby is a tragedy, spoiler alert. Um, and because of the way that it ends with Daisy not running away with the man that she's supposed to love, but staying with her quite frankly terrible husband, there's a bit of a dissonance created between the version of Daisy that we truly believe loves Gatsby and wants to be with him wholeheartedly compared to the horrible ending of the story. It creates this incongruity because her character is supposed to be this one specific way. So why does it matter for us to go back over these differences and understand them? It seems like a very nitpicky and probably pointless thing to do, but I would say it's a very important thing to do for multiple reasons. First of all, understanding these differences between these two adaptations also helps us understand the differences between storytelling mediums. Literary fiction and film are quite obviously very different. Literary fiction can do things that a film can't do in the sense of it can go on for hours and hours and hours. It can provide a depth to the theme and to the characters that a film doesn't always have time for. It also has a greater sense of interiority. However, a book can't have a soundtrack, not really. And a book also lacks the same visual components, quite obviously, that a film has as a visual medium. And so by understanding these differences between the two mediums and understanding the active interpretation that is inherently required when moving from a text to film, it helps future, adaptation, or future adaptations and filmmakers to understand the details of the movie that impress upon uh, the audience and the effect that is taken from the movie. So directors need to keep in mind every single aspect of the film and how they're representing these important works of literature with the soundtrack, with the performance, with the set. Because as film continues to have such a strong place in our current culture, it will inevitably shape how these books, these really important works of literature are remembered in current society. And so this leads to a broader question of what future adaptations should seek to accomplish. And I would argue that it goes beyond just a technical accuracy of representing the film scene by scene, word for word. We have to maintain the original spirit of the text, while also keeping in mind modern shifts in thought and modern perspectives. Thank you. We are now taking questions. Emma. I do think so, um, especially because as Nick sort of interjects throughout the film, um, he really sort of impresses a certain idea of the story. Um, there's this really um, kind of famously awkward scene in some ways where Daisy is touring Gatsby's house and he's throwing all these shirts out of his closet and then Daisy just breaks down and starts crying over these shirts. And in Clayton's movie, this moment just sort of happens. But in Lorman's movie, Nick kind of butts in with the voiceover and tells, you know, the reason she's crying is because she's upset she hasn't ended up with him. And so I think that's kind of how the voiceover continually interjects and just sort of uh, impresses this certain idea upon the viewer. Mm -hmm. Are there any other movies you were interested in kind of like breaking down and exploring, or was your primary focus um, Great Gatsby, and like how did you, I guess, land on that? 
Yeah, I had a lot of different ideas that I initially wanted to explore. Um, I did consider um, other movies. Uh, I really enjoy the book Rebecca, and there are a few film adaptations of that. And Sherlock Holmes, I think, would have been a very interesting character to see the different ways he's been adapted to film. Um, but I landed on The Great Gatsby because I remember watching it in high school, and the character of Daisy in particular, and our class was so divided in like pure hatred for her versus this kind of more sympathetic view of her, and I felt that divide was really interesting, and you could see that in both of the movies. I have a question. Okay. Okay. Um, so at the beginning you talked about like the opacity of Daisy, mm -hmm. and I thought that was really interesting. And I wanted to ask you which medium, film or book, do you think like best penetrates that opacity of the character? And do you think that's like an advantage or a disadvantage to the audience? I have different opinions on that. Um, I think first of all what makes her so opaque is the fact that she is filtered through the narrator Nick in the book and the movies. And then also Gatsby's memories, which I think are obviously very biased considering his obsession with her. Um, and I do think it's easier to understand her more in film because you get these nuances of expression and body language and tone of voice that I think can speak volumes as to what that actress's interpretation of Daisy is sort of thinking and feeling. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. What? Oh. <laughs> Wait, who is this? I'm not sure. Okay, somebody asked. Could there be a character like Daisy in a contemporary story? Could a character be trapped in that way? I do think so. I think um, Daisy was quite obviously trapped in her marriage and these societal expectations of the 1920s, but she's also in a very privileged position. And so I think it would be interested to explore characters who are trapped in different ways and trapped um, not in the same sort of mode of privilege that Daisy is trapped in. Is that it? Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. And now I would like to introduce Lacey Winfield, who is a sociology and anthropology major. And her honors thesis looks at uh, Orange Mounds in Memphis, Tennessee, in order to explore the important issues of discriminatory housing and the relationship between poverty and home ownership. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Lacey Winfield. My honors thesis is entitled Persistent Poverty, Housing, Economic Injustice in an Urban Environment. And so where the focus of this thesis came from was from the fact that I'm originally from Memphis. I went to high school not too far from Orange Mall. My high school is about two minutes away. And so I went to school with kids from the community and I've driven through Orange Mall and have been a part of different activities, but Orange Mall is one of those gems in US history that nobody talks about. You hear about Harlem, you hear about Detroit, you hear about Chicago, but you'll never hear about Orange Mound. And so I want to know how did housing economic policy impact Orange Mound and the relationship that persistent poverty and home ownership had on for urban and black communities. And so my uh, thesis had seven parts, and the first part is my methods. I traveled over 600 miles to and from Orange Mound to conduct research. I had a total of 13 questionnaires, a questionnaire I created myself, this census data collection analysis and a total of 15 interviews. Unfortunately, only 11 could be transcribed because of computer problems, but those 11 had a lot of meat and were really heavy. And so a brief background of Orange Mound. Orange Mound is arguably the first black owned community in the United States. In 1825, the Dedrick family actually opened a plantation. And so in 1889, the Dedrick decided to sell their plantation to a realtor named Mr. Meachman from New York. The Dedricks did not want to sell their plantation to Negroes, but Meacham thought it would be a great investment and sold it anyway. And so Orange Mound is called Orange Mound because of the orange Osage trees that grew in 1825, and you can still find them around today. Orange Mound encompasses two zip codes, 38114 and 38111. This is an aerial, aerial view of Orange Mound. As you can see, Orange Mound is situated between Cooper Young Midtown and University of Memphis. University of Memphis and Cooper Young area are both affluent white areas. And so that is important to remember as we go through this um, PowerPoint. 
And so now I want to talk about kind of the nitty gritty things of Orange Mountain economic policies. And to do that, you have to start before World War II. The Great Depression had ended, the War of War II was over, and soldiers were coming home, and there was a baby boom. So that means you needed housing for all these people coming back. The federal government decided to take it upon themselves to decide who had the right to own a home and who didn't. And so with this, the birth of persistent poverty kind of um, forms. And with these policies, you have de facto de jure segregation, which is merely de jure segregation is actual policies that are implemented. And de facto segregation is implied. So let's say all the African-American and students of color decide to sit in the back and the white students in the front. That's de facto segregation. That is implied and that is something that is kind of created, a norm that is created. And then with these policies, there's block busting, there's redlining, which leads to gentrification and placemaking. And now in modern day, can, can black people be gentrifiers too? Which is a big question many people are asking themselves and the big question that in Memphis we're asking ourselves too since Midtown and, um, Midtown and Cooper Young are starting to intrude onto Orange Mound. And so now we're gonna get more to the nitty gritty of the quantitative data analysis. I'm looking at rental, home ownership, properties and everything. And so as you can see the two um, zip codes we have, the darker the purple means the higher rates of homeowner, I mean, excuse me, rental rates in the community. The closer you get to the city center of Orange Mound, the higher the rates get. But the closer you get to the country club and to the University of Memphis, the rental rates decrease. And so as we look at home ownership, it's the complete opposite. There are little to no homeowners in Orange Mound, but again, as you get to affluent white communities, the home ownership rates increase. But there's two types of homeowners, right? There's homeowners who have a mortgage and homeowners who do not have a mortgage. And so I decided to look at homeowners with no mortgages. And what I found was pretty astounding. For most homeowners in Orange Mound, they don't have a mortgage, which is really beneficial. And the same thing can be said for the white affluent areas. However, my data that I collected had no correlation to the census data. And it has to do with the fact that I only had 15 informants, and most of my informants were over the age of 55. So as you can see, most of my informants did not own their home, did not rent their home, but did not have a mortgage. How is that possible? Family homes. What a family home is essentially a home that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. The name of the home is in the original owner, but the person who currently lives there is related to the owner. So therefore, they don't have to pay for anything because it's already been paid for. And so that's really has been a blessing to many of the residents of Orange Mound. It's also important to realize that 92.9% .9 of people in their community feel safe, and a majority of the people in the community have not faced financial constraints in their eyes. Orange Mound is, in fact, a persistently impoverished area. What that means is that over 30 years, 25% or more of the community has lived below the poverty rate. So you would think that people would consider themselves impoverished, but poverty is a perception of things. Just because you may think somebody's impoverished doesn't mean they see themselves in poverty. And so now we're getting to the fun part of my project, which was meeting people, interviewing, volunteering. I worked with a local nonprofit called Juice Orange Mound that worked in the community. And from what I've learned is that there's a spectrum of attitudes towards Orange Mound. The older you are, the more you loved Orange Mound. That's because you were around Orange Mound when it was a booming black haven. Orange Mound had two movie theaters, it had its own community pool, it had drive-ins, it had all black owned businesses. And for the fact, mostly because of the fact that there was during segregation, African Americans were not allowed to leave Orange Mound or were not allowed to leave South Memphis. But when integration happened and the crack epidemic came around, things started to change. And that is when you have the attitude and resentment come from younger generations. So many of my generations who are interviewed have um, left Orange Mound for school, but they still love Orange Mound. However, the ones who did not leave Orange Mound who still live there have a huge resentment for Orange Mound. One example is a young lady named Amanda. She has a one-year-old son, and she says she cannot wait to leave Orange Mound. She hates it there. And her reasons were she's tired of her son hearing random gunshots, she's tired of her son being hustled on the streets, and she's tired of crackheads basically her kid when he's trying to play outside. And so there's a schism of what Orange Mound looks like and the reality and the stigmas that are attached. For people who are older, Orange Mound, they're living in the heydays of Orange Mound. Like, it can't be that dangerous, it can't be that bad. But if you lived in Orange Mound after all of these events and poverty and violence has erupted, it's hard for you to fathom what Orange Mound used to be and how it used to be a black haven of Memphis, how Memphis really 
embody how Memphis really got its attitude and its identity from Orange Mound. But all in all, most people have this sense of Orange Mound pride. But you may not know that people from Memphis love being from Memphis. We will rep our city, we will rep everything. We don't say we're from Tennessee, we say we're from Memphis, Memphis. And so the same thing for Orange Mound. People love Orange Mound. People love South Memphis. People love being Hampton. There's this saying that they have is, what's your favorite color, orange, and where are you from, Mound? Like everybody in Orange Mound knows that. And so it's really important that just because they have left Orange Mound doesn't mean they still don't love Orange Mound. And obviously, there are going to be potential counter arguments and questions, like what is the future of Orange Mound and why are people leaving? But the biggest one I want to touch on is the last one. How can historically and predominantly black communities seem to have high levels of poverty and often violence? It has to do with the hypersegregation of African Americans in urban environments. African Americans since World War II have been pushed into urban small environments. How would you feel if this whole classroom was forced into one area and you were offered two jobs? What would you do in order to provide for your families, provide for yourself, and also to build generational wealth? If there's only two jobs for everyone in this classroom, there's not much you can do besides do incriminating activities. So when you hear people say, well, they just mean be naturally violent. No, that's not the case. When you're forced into these confinements, into these, these problems, you have no way of escaping besides through violent crimes or even any type of crimes. And so it's really important to remember that when we talk about urban environments that have high poverty and high crime, they're doing these crimes in order to provide for themselves. And as in a conclusion, it is important to realize that housing and economic discriminatory policies have on urban and black environments. You cannot expect for a community who's been disenfranchised for 70 years to automatically get to the point where, dis where unenfranchised groups are. So for a community that has been in poverty for so many years and could not own a home until the 70s, how do you expect for their kids to go to college or have generational wealth when there's been families who've had properties for since the 1800s can do the same thing? It's nearly impossible. There is also a correlation between home ownership and low wages, but it's proportional and inverse. And what that means, just because you own your property does not mean you can escape poverty that fast. You still have to pay property taxes. You still have to pay for infrastructure updates and upkept. You, you should not expect somebody to own their house to be like, oh, I'm free from poverty. That's not the case. However, if you do own your home, you have equity, you have credit, you have stability. You have these things that can help you little by little leave poverty, leave violence. And lastly, there is a correlation between generational wealth and home ownership. And generational wealth is simply, you are passing down wealth or necessities or assets to your kids. It could be education, it could be actually money, it could be a car, it could be anything that has value. And with generational wealth, that helps pull people out of poverty, but it doesn't take 10 years, it takes multiple years, it takes generations. So let's say, Beth passes her house down to her kid. Her kid doesn't have to worry about paying for a mortgage anymore. Her kid can save up their money to go to college. Once they get a college degree, that kid can save up more money to give to their kid, and it's a continual path. But for people who have never had those abilities, it's really hard to make that jump. Um, and the last thing I want to bring up is the fact that before you call a place the hood or the ghetto, look up the historical backgrounds of these communities. Remember the anthropological and sociological implications that have happened to these, these communities. Nobody puts themselves in poverty. Everybody wants to own a home. Everybody wants to have their own property. Everybody wants to have their own space. So before you look behind Jackson, sorry, Millsaps, or anywhere else, do realize that these people are trying to find a ways to help themselves out. And before we critique anybody, look at our own selves and realize these are our communities as well. So here are a few visual images of Orange Mound. This is all in the same block. You will see dilapidated homes that may be lived in and may not be lived in. This is the park that I spend most of my time doing interviews. They don't have any softball equipment. They don't have any hoops on the basketball courts and their water doesn't work. So you're telling kids like go outside, have fun. It's 110 degrees outside, but they can't play sports because there's nothing to play with them. And then there's the home that's well up to date and kept up. So Orange Mound is in fact an identity of Memphis. One of the informants I talked to says that Memphis would not be Memphis without Orange Mound. That's where soul music birthed, that's where 
some of the first black judges were birthed. And so without Orange Mound, Memphis would be nothing. And so uh, I would like to thank Dr. Bay, Dr. Ed Seaback, Dr. Groundhouse, Taylor Williams, and Dr. Toyota. Y'all are the best. But before I end it, I want to read a couple of quotes from one of the greatest Memphis rappers ever, Young Dolph. And he says, what am I supposed to do when I come from violence? In my hood, we, we hit the gas when we hear the sirens. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, how do you think the representations and the stereotypes of other parts of Michigan have influenced the So with Memphis is broken up into different areas, right? So my I went to an inner city high school, but it was located in like a white urban area, which is really weird, but because there's so much of a stigma on Memphis, none of Tennessee wants to help it out. They we have this saying that Shelby County was, and this was put in the corner because we were always bad. And so because of the stigmas, local, federal, local and federal governments do not put money or time and energy into Orange Mound. So that's why it has a placard saying like historical district, but there's always empty plots. And so that has really helped, has disadvantaged the funding that Orange Mound gets. But Memphis and Kyrieville gets plenty of funding. Okay, so there's a question from Keith Dunn. Which is more likely in Orange Mound, true development for and with the residents or eventual, eventual gentrification of the community? So it's kind of both, and if we're being honest. Like I said, Midtown is creeping in. So like people, white people are coming into Orange Mound and like trying to add these new funky cool things, which is beneficial economically, but you're pushing people out. But the fact that Orange Mound is a historical district, you can't change anything kind of solidifies that Orange Mountain isn't going anywhere, but the demographics will change. And I mentioned the term placemaking, and placemaking is essentially where you look at the uniqueness of the structure of the city, and you amplify those, those um, unique, unique ideas. So for example, if you know that people sit on, the, sit on um, milk crates all the time, you'll put milk crates in different public areas in order to create community and unity. And so it's really tricky to see what will happen to Orange Mountain. They're trying to revitalize it and keep it as a black booming, we'll try to rejuvenate to a black booming area. But a lot of people fear that Orange Mound will soon be gentrified and have like a lot of white hipsters coming into the area. Okay, and we have a question from Zaria Bonds. Uh, great presentation, Lacey. Can you talk more about the information that you received from your informants? So some of the, my favorite interviews came from Amanda and Mr. Desi. Mr. Desi was actually sold um, dope during the crack epidemic. And so he was a catalyst for why African-Americans were essentially dying. But it was because of the fact that his brother died in World War II after being lynched for no apparent reason. Um, and his parents also just kind of fell off after his brother died. So he had no resources in order to thrive. He remembers in high, in high school, when integration happened, uh, a white teacher telling him he would never succeed to be a lawyer. And so for them that hurt hard, hit, hits hard. Uh, with Amanda, it was very similar. She had a, didn't have her father, but her mom was always working, so she raised herself, essentially. And so she wants to leave Orange Mound because, you know, she's heard drive-by, she's seen shootouts, she's seen all of these things. It's not uncommon for somebody to be on the side of the street asking for some change, and she doesn't want to see that. And so it was really interesting to hear the different sides of the older generation and younger generation. Um, like I said, the young, older generation just loved Orange Mount, but they were always basking in the glory of the olden days. And so it was really hard to like listen to that, but then say like, but why are people still getting shot in Orange Mount and their bodies being left out there? Like, why is there food insecurities? Like, why aren't there any black owned businesses? And, but when you hear the younger generation, they, it's really hard for them to fathom that Orange Mount was for them because there's nothing black owned anymore. You can't even play basketball there. And so that was the most amazing part was hearing the, diff the, the schisms of uh, identity, the perceptions of Orange Mound. And so my two favorite ones were Amanda and um, Mr. Desi. Do we have time for one more? Okay, did you have a question, Emma? I didn't, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, so I'm from Memphis, so I wanted to say that you're being a positive number of growth of Midtown, and that you know, areas well, because I'm from the community. So I'm just wondering if you 
Oh yeah, like so it is detrimental, but like people in in Midtown, you know, are a unique group of people, and so they're trying to add funding and like help local black businesses. So it's not uncommon to see like Midtowners saying like, "Oh, let's go black, like let's shop black," but they still can't help the fact that they're intruding on two property that was never theirs. And so Orange Mountain has grown from what it used to be a plantation, but because of Midtown, especially the University of Memphis they're slowly starting to encompass on. So yes, you'll keep the original structures of Orange Mound, but they're white or they're Latina or they're you know, Arabic. So it's not the same what it used to be and which forces African-Americans and black Americans to leave Orange Mound to go to you know, Mississippi, DeSoto County, or even Whitehaven. Okay. One more? Sure. Okay. Uh, we have a question from the chat from Professor uh, Tredea Williams. She asks, can you discuss future improvements the residents of Orange Mound desire? So the biggest thing that Orange Mound really wants is funding for their parks. And they are tired of looking at dilapidated buildings. Um, one of the young men that I interviewed, he has a organic and all natural uh, food pantry and farm in Orange Mound. It sounds crazy. He has his own chickens, he has his own catfish farm, like everything you need is there. And so they're really looking for like food sustainability and parks for their kids to go to. You have crime because kids are bored. You have teen pregnancy because kids are bored. And without parks, there is nothing for the kids to do. Like you have nowhere close to walk to in Orange Mound besides you have the community center, but it's COVID. So kids can't even go to the community center. You have the senior center, but it's COVID. And so if there aren't any outdoor activities for the kids to do anything, you're going to have you know, violence, you're going to have, you know, drug trafficking, you're going to have prostitution, you're going to have all these things that are happening in the Orange Mound because there's nothing the kids have to do. And they really just want to be recognized by the city in Tennessee, right? You put a plaque that says this is a historical district, but you do nothing else. And so Tennessee doesn't even recognize Orange Mound. Like you will never find Orange Mound in the, in the history book of Tennessee, which is disfortunate because New York has Harlem and all these other places have these other black cities. You know, Louisiana has New Orleans. Why can't Tennessee recognize the black hub and haven for, you know, a southern state? So as bad as it sounds, South Memphis may be safe just because of the stigma that it has. Like people aren't afraid of Orange Mound as much as they are of South Haven, if we're being completely honest. You, most people would not even step foot in South Haven. But the same thing has happened to Bing Hampton, right? Bing Hampton used to be the place that you never step foot in, and now you have gardens and chic shops and art boutiques that aren't really asked for in the community. But they will say like, oh, we're just trying to be revenue in these things in the community, but are you asking the populations in the community? So if there's a strong stigma a part of that community or neighborhood, they're probably safe, but they aren't being funded. But if there's not that strong of a stigma, then the likelihood of being gentrified will happen. Same thing as Harlem, right? Harlem is now a haven for gentrification. You have bougie chicken shops that are $22 for a leg and a wing. So anywhere is not safe usually. Um, one question in the chat uh, from Mary Thomas. Can you tell us more about the work Juice Orange Mound is doing? So Juice Orange Mound originated from a local Memphian who graduated, lived in Orange Mound, but came back. Um, she was working at, currently working at Harding, but what they are trying to do is fundraise in themselves. Brittany Thornton is her name, is trying to fundraise money from local, from people in the community to do little activities. So they have a change drive where they go around asking for change and we'll use that to fund, fund events. So like I work with them on their social distancing garden for people in the community to have fresh produce because they don't have fresh produce. They don't even have a Kroger. So like there's nothing in Orange Mountain for them to get fresh produce besides like the gas station, which is for banana, $10 type of thing. And so she's really trying to bring in small businesses. She's really trying to help the pockets of black entrepreneurs. So Orange Mound can depend on itself and not have to leave to go to Midtown, being Hampton, downtown to receive the goods that they need. Okay, we had a question up here. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it came from a really beautiful article from Andrea Perry. And when we think of gentrifiers, we think of white people typically being gentrifiers, but gentrification has nothing to do with race. In fact, it has to do with socioeconomic status and economic status. If you have more wealth than the people in that community and you decide to move in, you are gentrifying that community. So if I move into Orange Mound, I will be essentially gentrifying that community because you're pushing people out who were originally living there. You're causing interest rates to increase. You're causing property values to increase. If those people don't have livable wages to keep up with them, where are they going to go? But to think about black gentrifiers that Andrea Moore, Andrea Moore sorry, uh, emphasized was you have to replenish back into the community. So either you volunteer or you do funding or you work with local nonprofits or you just keep the black urban environment alive. You, instead of you asking for a Starbucks, like, hey, well, not ask for a you know, black owned business to come into the area. And just to realize that you are gentrifying the area, but unfortunately, that's, it, that's, it's just gonna happen. Okay, any other questions? All right, in the back. I'm sorry, Kamal, what'd you say? Oh, okay, sorry, y'all know I'm hard of hearing. Um, so Young Dolph is originally from Chicago, but he moved to South Memphis, which is not too far from Orange Mound, but it's still pretty far, when he was like nine or 10. And so when he says what I'm supposed to do when I come for violence, people expect for kids from the hood just to like leave the hood and like, I finally made it, but if you have seen violence and poverty and destruction your entire lives, your psychology is warped. For example, we had the marshmallow effect, which is where they interviewed kids from lower income communities and from affluent communities. And they say, you take a piece of candy now, or you can wait two days and get more. The lower income kids decide to take now because the future, you never know what the future will hold for them. They never know if they're gonna make it to the next day. And so when you come from violence, your psychology is warped. So the choices you make are warped, not because you have no self-control, but because like, this is all you have seen for so long. Same thing for like affluent kids your dad has always invested money. Well, it's important for you to invest money because you've seen that behavior of investment. And so when, in the last quote, in my hood, we hit the gas when we hear sirens, the police is never your friend. Orange Mountain does not have a police, pr pr police precinct, they have a fire station, but so they're not being over police, but they're being under police as well. So like you don't go to the police if somebody got shot or like if you need help, you kind of figure it out on your own because the police are usually going to try to suspect you for something you did not do or give you a longer sentence. And with Memphis, we have a conservative judge and she has, is notorious for putting in um, heavy sentences for minor crimes. And so like hood 101, don't trust the police. And hood 101, again, you do what you gotta do in order to survive. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So we would just like to thank everyone for showing up today, uh, both those in person and online. I think I speak for all of us when I say this has been a very rewarding experience, even though it was challenging at times. I'd also like to thank the Honors Committee and our, all of our advisors. Um, without their continual support and their feedback, this couldn't have happened. We'd also like to thank Michael Stamey for the tech support and operating the live stream, as well as Phi Beta Kappa and the judges, and Dr. Toyota for putting all of this together. Um, so if you could please sanitize your stations when you leave, and thank you again for coming.